All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's important debate on the deity of Christ. And I am thrilled to have Anthony Rogers and Andrew Griffin with me to debate this important topic. Specifically, they are going to be engaging the question, does Colossians teach the deity of Christ? And I got to say, I am excited. I am pumped to see what Anthony and also Andrew are going to bring to the table in terms of arguments and points for tonight's debate. So gentlemen, let's get acquainted and break the ice a little bit before we get into our opening statements. Anthony, why don't we start with you? It's great to have you back. And I appreciate your time. How have you been? A little bit about yourself. I've been great. It's good to be back. It's good to be here and with Andrew. I give Andrew props. We've debated before and he always chooses good topics. Last time it was the deity of Christ in the Gospel of John, which was over three years ago. This time it's the book of Colossians. So I'm excited for this. For those that don't know me, I am a pastor in the Presbyterian Church of America. In that capacity, I serve with metanoia prison ministry. So I labor among prisoners and for prisoners. I also have been doing apologetics for around 30 years. That isn't out of an interest to debate and argue as I am doing tonight, but uh, out, really out of a love for evangelism. I think of this as simply a way of doing evangelism one way. So uh, that's me. That's what I do. I'll have an after party afterwards. If anybody's interested on my channel, come over and check it out. Awesome. Sounds fun. Look like looks like we're going to have an all nighter of uh, the deity of Christ. So we're going to have tonight's debate and then an after party over on Anthony's channel. I do appreciate the intro there. For those who want to see more from Anthony Rogers, please check the description box where I have uh, his YouTube channel linked for people to see. Andrew Griffin, it's great to have you back as well. Uh, you're certainly no stranger to debates, you or Anthony. So I think this is going to be an excellent exchange of ideas. And so, Andrew, how have you been? A little bit about yourself. I've been really good. Um, I'm Andrew from Unitarian Apologetics. I've been doing debating for about four or five years, studying theology for about the same amount of time. Uh, I've had the honor to debate Anthony in the past and definitely looking forward to it again. Uh, and hearing what he has to uh, his arguments. Um, I have a small YouTube channel called Unitarian Apologetics, where I basically just walk through uh, books of the Bible, such as the Gospel of John. And uh, I also have a video uh, that might get you acquainted with my channel. It's called The Meta Narrative of the Bible and introduces the temple from beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And it might help you get familiar with my approach to theology. All right, Andrew, I appreciate the introduction. I've also got your channel linked in the dis uh, description box of this video for people to check out. Anthony, Andrew, again, I appreciate the time you've given to us for tonight's important debate. And so allow me to go over the format for tonight's event. And so we're going to be having a comprehensive debate tonight. Again, the question, does Colossians teach the deity of Christ? Many could say it's the much anticipated rematch. I understand it's been a few years since round one. And so we're going to be having 20 minute opening statements. Anthony in the affirmative tonight will be kicking us off with openings. Then we're going to have a 15 minute uninterrupted rebuttal. Then we're going to jump right into cross exam. And so we're going to have 15 minutes each for cross-examination. Then we're going to have a period of counter rebuttals. This is going to be 10 minutes. Then we'll have a five-minute concluding statement where our guests tonight can wrap up their thoughts and points. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We are going to have an audience Q&A, roughly 30 minutes. And so please, if you do have a question, for our debaters tonight, Anthony Rogers and Andrew Griffin, just let me know who the question's for and do your best to tag me. At Standing for Truth or at Donnie, it looks like we've already got Super Chats coming in. A Syrian born again, I do appreciate the support. She says, God bless you, Brother Donnie. God bless you as well. Okay, so with that, gentlemen, let's get right into the debate itself. We've got our 20-minute opening statement. So Anthony, whenever you're ready, please just let me know and the floor is yours. All right. 
Well, I want to begin, as always, by ascribing all glory, honor, and praise and eternal dominion to the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. In order to profit from what Paul says vis-a-vis Christ in Colossians, it's requisite, I think, to have two things firmly fixed before our eyes, both of which uh, are significant in terms of informing us about Paul's own formative background. That is, they formed and informed Paul's own understanding as reflected in the epistle to the Colossians. Well, as for that first point, that which formed Paul's teaching, Paul was, of course, a Jew, and as such, he was steeped in the Old Testament scriptures. Although Paul does not formally cite the Old Testament in this short epistle, he does most certainly echo and allude to it, and he always speaks in accordance with it. Paul would have expected those who read and heard the epistle then to share and pick up on this background and so recognize the concepts and echoes when they were at play. To give a few key passages from this formative background, which everyone should recognize, one is Deuteronomy 6. It's known, of course, and confessed by every God-fearing Jew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. On the basis of this, for Paul as a Jew and for the early Christians who had come to accept the Old Testament, while others might be called Lord, such as Abraham, who was called Lord by Sarah and Eliezer, there's only one Lord in heaven, only one Lord in a religious sense, only one Lord who is to be worshipped and served. To him, we are to give our all. As the Shema goes on to say, with respect to this one Lord, we are to love him with all of our heart, soul, and strength. And his word is to dwell richly within our hearts and mouths, Moses says. This is filled out further just a few chapters later in Deuteronomy 10, where it is written, Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God? Note all these things but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. He is your praise, and he is your God. Well, these are but two chapters of the Old Testament speaking of who God is and of how we are to relate to him. He is, according to these texts, the one Lord, the one Lord who is in heaven, the one Lord we are to fear, the one Lord we are to serve the one Lord before whom we are to walk, the one Lord in whose name we are to swear and do all that we do, the one Lord whose word is to dwell in our hearts and whom we are to serve with all of our heart. Of course, this is but a summary, a brief list. There are many other things mentioned in the Old Testament, such as that he, as Lord alone, is our life. He alone is to be the object of our faith. Uh, when we sin against him, it is against him and him only that we sin. And so it's him alone who is able to forgive sins, Daniel 9. Well, a second point I would have you keep in mind is that this Paul, for whom the Old Testament formed the background of his teaching, was the same Paul who had a radical, life-transforming encounter with the risen and ascended Christ that further informed his understanding. When Jesus appeared to Paul in a blaze of glory from heaven in his glorified human form and likeness, he was identified for Paul and by Paul on that occasion as Lord. Who are you, Lord, Paul said, to which the reply came from the divine glory, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Significantly, this encounter has all the earmarks of an Old Testament theophany, and it's especially patterned after the theophany experienced by Ezekiel near the Kabar River where the prophet saw the Lord of glory in the form or likeness of a man. When you lay side by side the appearance of the Lord in Ezekiel 1 to the version of Paul's experience on the road to Damascus recounted in Acts 26, they both have the exact same order. Moreover, they share various words in common. And one of the phrases found in Ezekiel 1 and Acts 26 is only found in these two places in all of Greek literature. 
Now, that encounter did not displace, but profoundly informed, and in that sense, transformed what Paul understood to be the import of the Old Testament. From that time on, when Paul cited Old Testament passages that use the divine name, Lord, the passages are more often than not applied to Jesus, and outside of Old Testament quotations about the Lord that usually ref- uh, they usually refer to Jesus. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I mean to say that outside of Old Testament quotations that usually refer to Jesus, when Paul is not citing the Old Testament, it always refers to Jesus. Now, with these two facts in mind, the first thing I want to observe vis-a-vis this epistle is that Paul calls Jesus Lord 14 times in Colossians, a fact that's already significant in light of the foregoing and in light of the fact that this is such a short epistle, only four chapters. And when we look at how Paul uses the word Lord for Jesus, it is patently obvious that he's using the word Lord in the all-important religious sense established in the Old Testament, the sense in which it was confessed by all Jews in relation to Yahweh alone. Note, for example, what Paul says in Colossians 4.1, Masters, hurioi, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Here, Paul speaks of earthly masters, curioi, those who are over slaves, and then of a single master or lord, kurios, who is in heaven over them all, both masters and slaves. For Paul as a Jew, and for any Jew hearing this, and anyone steeped in the Old Testament, this one Lord who is in heaven over all can only be Yahweh, the one Lord of Israel. This one is not Lord in some earthly sense, but in a religious sense. He is in heaven, and all are subject to him. And yet, Paul is clearly referring here to Christ as this Lord, not only because, as I said, the Lord is always a reference to Jesus in Paul's writings, but because in the immediately preceding context it is written, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Notice here that Paul emphatically identifies Christ as the Lord in heaven whom men serve, So when he speaks of the one Lord who is in heaven in 4.1, he is contextually talking about Christ. More than that, he even assigns to Christ the Lord, the Lord who is in heaven over all, that kind of service that Deuteronomy 6 and 10 say is to be rendered to Yahweh alone. Paul says believers are to work heartily as for the Lord. That is, believers are to serve Christ the Lord with all their hearts, echo Deuteronomy 6.5. And he says that Christ as Lord will repay without partiality, echo Deuteronomy 10.17. In the course of saying all of this, Paul even makes a pointed contrast here between Christ as Lord and those who are merely men. For he says we are to render our service for the Lord rather than for men. That Christ is the Lord here is further buttressed by the fact that Paul refers in this epistle to himself, Epaphras, and Tychicus as fellow bondservants of Christ in 1.7 and 4.7. And also because in that companion text, Ephesians 6, it's a sister epistle, it says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So over and above slaves, above earthly masters, those who are masters on earth and according to the flesh, Christ is the one Lord who is in heaven, the one Lord who is over all, the one Lord who is to be served with all of our hearts, the one Lord who shows no partiality, the one to whom we owe absolute allegiance that trumps anything we owe to any man. Another evidence that Christ is Lord in a religious sense is seen in Colossians 3.12-13, through where it says, 
as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Here again, Paul is clearly using the word Lord in a religious sense, for he grounds the interpersonal or horizontal forgiveness extended to fellow believers on the Lord's own forgiveness of sins committed against him, something that only a divine person can do. As David said in the Psalms, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, or as Daniel 9 says, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. That Paul is speaking of Christ as Lord here is also evident. First, to reiterate again, because the word Lord in Paul is always a reference to Jesus. Second, because Paul explicitly identifies Jesus as the Lord throughout the context. In 3.17, he refers to the Lord Jesus. In 3.24, to the Lord Christ. Uh, This teaching, by the way, that Christ is the one Lord who forgives is consistent with the rest of Scripture, which speaks of Christ as the agent of forgiveness, such as Mark 2, or Mark, Paul's traveling companion and fellow laborer, recorded Jesus saying to the paralytic man, Son, your sins are forgiving you, or are forgiven you, which led the religious leaders to accuse Jesus of blasphemy, since forgiveness belongs to God. The same account is recorded by Luke, another traveling companion of Paul's, as well as by Matthew uh, and so forth. Uh, In fact, the apostles, all of them, spoke to the Sanhedrin and said that it's Jesus who grants repentance and forgiveness of sins in Acts 5. So according to Paul in Colossians, in concert with Mark and Luke, his traveling companions, and Matthew and all the other apostles, Jesus is the one Lord to whom belongs mercies and forgiveness. And no wonder, for the Lord who forgives, the Lord Jesus, is the one in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1. He is the one who brought about reconciliation and made peace through the blood of his cross, 120. He's the one who presents believers as holy and blameless and beyond reproach, 122. And it's in him that the certificate of debt was canceled and taken away, being nailed to his cross, 214. Another indication of what Paul means by calling Jesus Lord is seen in Colossians 3, where it is written, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. The significance of this would not be lost on those who know the Old Testament, as Paul certainly did. According to the Old Testament, God does whatever he does for the sake of his own name. And in so doing, he shows that we are to do likewise. The Lord swears by his name, Genesis 22, and his people are to swear by his name. Repeatedly, this is stated in the Law and the Prophets. The Lord blesses in his name, and his people are to bless in his name, Deuteronomy 10, Deuteronomy 21, 1 Chronicles 23. The Lord does everything he does, whatever it is, whether saving, guiding, judging, anything else, For the sake of his name and his people are to follow suit. They're to walk in his name. And this is in stark contrast, by the way, to the pagans who walk in the name of other gods. As it is written in Micah 4, though all the nations walk each in the name of his God, as for us believers, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Zechariah 10.12, speaking of what God will bring about when he accomplishes final redemption, says, I will strengthen them in the Lord. Notice it's God speaking here about the Lord in the third person. I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. The Old Testament instructs us to do all that we do in the name of the Lord and says that the Lord at the time of redemption will strengthen people in the Lord so that they will walk in his name alone. And Paul, writing in the aftermath of the redemption accomplished, said, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Fourth, as Lord, Jesus is the object of faith. In Colossians 1.4, Paul speaks of praying always for the Colossians, quote, since the day we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. He continues this theme in Colossians 2, making it clear that it's, it's faith in Christ as Lord that he has in view. He says, and I quote, even though I am absent in body, Nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, 
So walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. And quote, according to the Old Testament, there is only one Lord in whom men are to put their faith. One Lord they are to trust, one Lord who is to be their refuge. In fact, the Old Testament says, cursed is he who puts his trust in men. Cursed is he who trusts in Egypt. Cursed is he who trusts in princes, in horses, and so forth. Scripture teaches us to entirely remove all confidence in men and rest it solely in the Lord. Paul says, in the Lord Jesus. Moreover, when Paul says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, he immediately adds, so walk in him. Here he picks up on something he said in 1, 10 through 11, where he says, we are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and are to please him in all respects. That is, Christ is the Lord who is to be served absolutely, this Lord in whom we are to put our faith. Earthly lords may be obeyed so far as the limits of their delegated authority go, but Christ is to be served in all respects. There are no limits, nothing that trumps the service that we owe to him. This is exactly what Deuteronomy 6 and 10 enjoin upon people in relation to the Lord. They are to confess him as their Lord, believe in him, and they're to walk in his ways, and they're to serve him as the Lord of lords. Here, Paul identifies Jesus as the Lord of believers and says that believers are to walk in him. That is, they're to walk in accordance with his ways by virtue of their union with him through faith. In fact, Paul even says of Christ, the Lord in whom we are to believe, the Lord in whose ways we are to walk, that our very ability to do this is because of the power that he supplies. In 1.10, he speaks of praying for the Colossians that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And in verse 11, he says, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, that is Christ's glorious might. Further down in 129, Paul speaks of laboring and striving according to his, Christ's power, which works mightily in me. Now, what earthly or creaturely Lord can claim that people are to believe in him, walk in him, and that they're to do so by the power which he supplies and works mightily within them through their faith? If you were to ask a non-Christian religious Jew, whether before, during, or after the time of Christ, who is the one Lord in whom you're to put your faith, whom you are to fear, whom you are to serve with all your heart, in whose ways and in whose name you're to walk and do all that you do, and by whose mighty power you're able to do all these things. Who would he say that one Lord is? Well, without question, he would say the Lord our God. If you were to ask Paul, who is this Lord? He would say, it's Jesus whom I was persecuting. Now, if all this were not enough, and it's more than enough, really, for those who have ears to hear, Paul even tells us in Colossians 1.19 that God was pleased for all the fullness to dwell in him, that is, in Jesus. In light of the Old Testament, there should be no doubt that what Paul means here when he speaks this way is that Christ is deity. In 1.19, when he says he was pleased for all the fullness to dwell in him, he is echoing Psalm 68, where it is written, the Lord was pleased to dwell in Zion. In the past, God was pleased to dwell in Zion, but now in these last days, he was pleased to dwell among us in a more radical way. That more radical way is further explicated in Colossians 2.9, where Paul says, in Christ dwells all the fullness of deity in bodily form. And it's precisely because Jesus is the fullness of deity, and so self-sufficient godhood belongs to him, that those who are in him are made complete. Because he is self-sufficient, he is all-sufficient for his people, Paul is saying. In him who is the fullness, we are rendered complete or full, that is, we who believe. As Paul goes on to say, in him you have been filled up or made complete. All of this, by the way, is exactly what John said. In John 1, the apostle identifies Christ as God the Word, 1-1. One, one. And then in 1-14, note what he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Because Jesus is the eternal word who dwelt among us in the flesh, and as such is full of grace and truth, an echo of Exodus 34, John went on to say, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Because Christ is the fullness of deity, 
full of grace and truth. Everything that a believer needs, they receive from him and in him. Do we need redemption? In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1.14. Do we need new hearts? In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, 2.11. Do we need life? He is our life, Colossians 3.4. We've been raised up with him and in him, 2.13. Do we need wisdom and knowledge? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ, Colossians 2.8. And closely related to all of this, Scripture speaks not only of us being in Christ and being complete in him, but of Christ being in us. Do we need hope? Christ in you, the hope of glory, 127. Do we need peace? He is our peace. So Paul can say, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The bottom line is, this Christ in whom all the fullness of deity dwells is all and in all, Colossians 3.11. A final thing that Paul tells us about Christ is found in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, where Paul teaches that Jesus is preeminent over all reality. He's preeminent over all creation, according to 1, 15 through 17, and he's preeminent over the new creation in 1, 18 through 20. His preeminence over creation. Seconds. What's that? You got 20 seconds, Anthony. Okay, well, uh, I'll just say here that 115 through 17 identifies Christ as the one who created all things and is the one who is before all things and in whom all things subsist. And he's also the one who is the head who reigns supreme over the church. So Christ is supreme over the creation as the one in whom and for whom all things were made. And he's supreme over the church, which is his body, which he redeemed. This is the Christ presented to us in scripture. This is the Christ one must believe in if they are to be made complete, if they're to be redeemed, if they're to be reconciled, if they're to have that wisdom that is conducive to eternal life. Anthony, thank you very much for that opening statement to the audience. I do see the questions, the comments, and I am all caught up. I appreciate it. Again, if you do have a question for our guests, just make sure you are uh, tagging me. That'll be the best way I don't miss it since the chat is, is quite lively already, which is good. We got a lot of engagement for tonight's epic debate. Okay, Andrew Griffin, we're now going to hand it over to you. And whenever you're ready, you have 20 minutes for an opening statement. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you very much. Great presentation, Anthony. I appreciate that. All right. I got a screen to share here, if that's okay. Sure. <clears throat> All right, can you see it? Yes, looks good. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, so Colossians, does Colossians teach the deity of Christ? I want to start by introducing this clear, indisputable, explicit hermeneutical fact within the book of Colossians that we can't just explain away or force some sort of presupposition on and if we were to do so that would not be a sound hermeneutical process reading colossians 1 3, 3 that we give thanks to the god of our lord jesus by jesus having a god this clearly indicates that there is someone who is more powerful than him and someone whose will is sovereign over his uh, some of the key points we're going to discuss in this presentation, the key text, of course, Colossians hymn, uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 20, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, head of the church, all of these things, of course. And then, of course, Colossians 2, 9, the fullness of the deity dwells in him bodily. One of the main points that Paul is trying to uh, portray here is against false approaches to God, different types of religious services people were offering. And Paul's demonstrating why those are false and that actually everything that we need to overcome the world and to understand God and his plan and his purpose are found in Christ. So leading up to the hymn, there's two primary topics which Paul speaks about throughout the letter. The first is revelation, wisdom, and knowledge. Colossians 1, 9 through 10, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God 
to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And sorry, something else I wanted to establish here. Nowhere in the Old Testament or in the New Testament does the title God ever equal Trinity. Never should we see the title God and think that's a reference to the Trinity. This is an indisputable hermeneutical fact that we must bear in mind when we're reading the Bible. Of course, Jesus is given the generic title God at times, just like Satan is given the generic title God, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians. But never does God equal Trinity. And anytime we see the title God in the book of Colossians, we should have the Father in mind. Given uh, the second uh, topic, which Paul speaks about throughout this book, is uh, power. He's given power to Jesus. And uh, he says, giving thanks to the Father, the one having qualified you for the share of the inheritance, who delivered us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so this leads us up into the Colossians hymn. So in Colossians 15, A, he is the image of the invisible God. One thing that's clearly indicated here is that Jesus is not the invisible God. He is the image of, he is the representation of God. Ever since in ancient history, all throughout ancient history, beginning at least 2,000 years before Christ, we see 1500 BC, we see the Pharaoh is called image of Ray, son of Amon, beloved son, living image, etc. 700 BC, the Assyrian king is called the image of Shamash or image of Marduk. 200 BC, we, in Hellenistic kingship, Ptolemy Epiphanes is called the living image of Zeus. Even post biblical 100 AD, we see Plutarch, the ruler, is the image of God who orders all things. <clears throat> so Jesus is the image of his God, he is the image of the invisible God. We read about this invisible God other places in the Bible, including in Pauline literature. No one has ever seen God at any time. John in 1 John 4.12. He who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, which no man has seen or can see. 1 Timothy 6.16. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever only referring to one person, not a trinity, and only the Father alone. We don't need to go outside of the Bible to understand this image language. We see in Genesis 1.26, man is made in the image of God so that he can subdue and rule. Psalm 8 tells us that man was made a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor, made a ruler, and everything was put under his feet. Of course, this theme is extended Christologically in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, for God has put everything under his feet. Ephesians 1.22, God put everything under his feet and made Jesus head over everything. So we have to understand that any power that Jesus receives, because God made him to have that power. God put him in that position and empowered him. God always retains power over Christ. And again, in Hebrews, when God subjected all things to him, he left nothing out of his control. So Jesus is actually given sovereign power within the created order. Uh, Of course, we can't miss the allusions there to wisdom. Uh, Another thing is it's widely noted for hundreds of years prior to Jesus and hundreds of years after that the king is the embodiment of wisdom. So we see these allusions here to Jesus being the embodiment of wisdom all throughout the New Testament, but it's important to see, uh, to understand how to put it together, to understand what Paul and other New Testament writers are saying. Uh, We read in wisdom literature, for wisdom is a breath of the power of God and a pure effulgence of the glory of the Almighty. She is a reflection of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of his goodness. We see in Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the effulgence, the same word here, used in wisdom literature, and the exact representation of his nature. So Jesus, as the image of God, perfectly represents one person's nature. It says, upholding all things by his powerful word. But we have to understand about Jesus' word. Jesus tells us that he speaks the things which he heard from his God. 
He says he doesn't speak of his own self. We're also not to imagine Jesus just holding a note. And if he just stops speaking, the whole world's going to implode on itself. I have to understand that he's maintaining and implementing cosmic harmony with the things he speaks and the words he received from his God. F.F. Bruce says it's brilliantly when he says, to say that Christ is the image of God is to say that in him the nature and being of God have been perfectly revealed, that in him the invisible become has become visible. All right, and 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 so to help uh, further illustrate this, I want to point us to Romans 10, where we see this title Christ. And so for Paul at, at times, the title Christ equals wisdom. So for Paul at times, Christ is a revelation and equal to wisdom, a set of instructions and ideals by which man should live. He quotes, uh, he's quoting Deuteronomy 30 in uh, Romans 10. Eight, 10, 8 through 10, he says, the man who does these things will live by them, but righteousness that is by faith says this, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, and who is descend, descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Christ here is not a, a literal person that you're going to bring down or to bring uh, send into uh, the abyss and bring Christ up. And actually, Paul's most probably making an allusion here to and referencing the Targums, which speak about Moses ascending up to grab the law or Jonah descending down into the abyss, that is to bring the law up. And so it's the particular revelation. It shows that Paul can use the title Christ to equal wisdom. Firstborn over all creation, Colossians 1.15b. Joshua Jip notes here, in Israel, the firstborn son held a special place within the family as he was endowed with his father's inheritance, entrusted with his father's authority, and given a royal and priestly role within the family. Of course, we read in Romans 8, 29, that Jesus would be the firstborn um, of many brethren, which would be predestined to be conformed into his image, to death, so that Christ would be the firstborn among many brethren. And we see this theme also in Genesis 49.3. Jacob says to Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength, and the beginning of my children. We see this same exact thing in Colossians 1.18. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in all things he may have preeminence. Of course, we can't miss the allusion here to uh, speaking about the firstborn of Psalm 88.28 in the Septuagint. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Again, Anything that Christ was is because God made him that. Reading the Colossians hymn, because in him all things were created in the heavens and upon the earth, the visible and the invisible. It's important to note here, and it's going to change drastically how you view this text, if you see it as in him or by him. These are two different things. The text actually says that all things were created in him, not by him. Uh, Philo points out, for God is the cause, not the instrument. And that which comes into being is brought not into being through an instrument, but by a cause. Never is Jesus said to be the cause of the universe. For instance, God will create through his word, through his wisdom, through his knowledge. But it is not the word of the wisdom or knowledge that creates. It's God who creates through an instrument. And so never is anything said to be created, even in texts which Trinitarians use to try to say that Jesus was somehow involved in creation, never are things said to be by him or from him. And Paul is saying here that there are to be in him. And so really we have to ask ourselves, well, are we talking about a dative of sphere here or an instrumental dative? And a dative of sphere would be in, in the realm of these things which exist and are expressed in Christ, or an instrumental dative Data would, of course, be something that actually Christ was there, somehow involved in creation itself. I like this from Douglas Moo in his commentary on Colossians. He says, positively, Paul uses the preposition in quite a lot, as in Christ all things were created, in Colossians with Christ as a subject. And most of them, perhaps even all of them, express the idea of sphere. We think it more likely than that this opening line is claiming that Christ is the one in whom all things were created. He wants to make the very general point that all of God's creative work took place in terms of or in reference to Christ. And we see 
examples of this in the book of Colossians itself, Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, rooted up and built in him. We're not to imagine that we're walking in an actual person. Uh, this is referring to a particular mode of conduct, which is based on truths and laws and ideals, which are, Paul finds perfectly expressed in the person of Christ. Thrones and dominions. For the sake of time, I don't think Anthony will argue this, but it's important to the book of Colossians. I like this from Walter Wink on these thrones, dominions, powers. He says, these powers are both heavenly and earthly, divine and human, spiritual and political, invisible and structural. We would expect them to include human agents, social structures and systems and divine powers. Again, Colossians 1.19 for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ. That's one person who's pleased to have his fullness dwell in another person. Of course, there is an allusion, as Anthony pointed out already, to Psalm 68, Psalm 67 in the Septuagint. Uh, in 119, it says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Speaking of the temple that was on Zion, it says the mountain Zion on which God was pleased to dwell. Now, if God's dwelt in the temple, never would we think that the temple itself is God because God dwells in it. And the same is with Christ. God has allowed his fullness to be in Christ, it says here, and through Christ reconciled to himself all things, one person. And this is also a temporary dwelling which God has bestowed on Christ to accomplish a particular purpose. Colossians 2.9, we want to get some context leading up to when it's saying, for in Christ the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. He's speaking about uh, revelation. He says that, for I want you to know how much I am struggling for you to be encouraged in heart and filled with the riches of complete understanding, so that you know may, may know the mystery of God, Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so for Paul, God created in Christ, in this in this mystery of this plan that he has for mankind, uh, this eternal plan is how Paul sees it. Okay, and it goes on to say, therefore continue to walk in him, be built up in him. See that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, which are based on human tradition and spiritual forces and not according to Christ. So again here, this is comparing two different modes or methods of understanding or coming to an understanding. And you're not supposed to walk according to these empty deceive, the, the deceiving philosophies, but you're supposed to walk according to Christ, which is Christ has become to us wisdom from God. And concerning this word theotetos, which is the word for Godhead there, uh, the theological dictionary of the New Testament says that this word occurs only once in the New Testament, Colossians 2.9, in him dwells the fullness of the theotetos bodily, has us compare it with 1.19. It says, the one God of the Old Testament has attracted to himself, one person, all divine power in the cosmos. And on the early Christian view, he has given this fullness of power to Christ as the bearer of the divine office. So I understand this fullness of the theotetos or deity is all the revelation of God and power from God are found in Christ alone and not dispersed out through the cosmos. These are centrally located in the person of Christ. But notice the temporality of this authority. Does it not say that Christ has always had this inherently since the beginning of creation? It was given to him for a temporary amount of time to accomplish a specific purpose. Uh, Donnie, how are we doing on time? You're doing good. You have exactly five minutes left, Andrew. I want to walk. Uh, thank you very much. I want to walk through Ephesians real quick. Ephesians is also uh, often called the twin epistle because the content is so similar to what we're reading in Colossians. He opens Colossians by saying, blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus. Here he is again, understanding that whoever Jesus is and whatever he's been empowered with, he still has a God who is over him and he has been made Lord. Uh, it says, uh, so this God had the God, this God, and Father of Lord Jesus Christ is the one who actually blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. For he, one person, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, it shows that, that God, 
the, in the New Testament authors, God was busy prior to the, the creation of the universe planning things out. Never do we see that Jesus planned anything out or predestined anything. And we shouldn't assume that we actually existed because we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. This is God's planning process and God's uh, plan for uh, uh, the, the end times. We'll see here further in, in Ephesians. And in love, he predestined us for adoption according to the pleasure of his will. Nothing's ever done according to the will of Jesus. Okay. And then says, which he purposed in Christ. One person purposed as a plan for the fullness of time to bring all things in heaven and on earth together in Christ. And so again, Christ becomes the instrument through which God accomplishes his will. All right. And then it says, and God put everything under his feet and made him head over everything. Anything that Christ was because God empowered him and made him that. Uh, let's see. And then again, here it says, Surely you have heard about the stewardship of God's grace. That is the mystery of Christ made known to me by revelation. This mystery. So he's going to talk about the mystery, which is Christ, which God predestined and foreordained before the end of the world, uh, before the beginning of the world. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, partakers in the promises in Christ Jesus. This mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. So only one person, again, God cannot equal Trinity. God here is only one person. Paul believes that only one person created all things. His purpose is now that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of one person should be known to all rules and authorities in heaven, heavenly realms, according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And just uh, to, to wrap it up, my last slide here, uh, beautiful uh, uh, expression of, of what we're learning about here. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28, then the end will come. So he's talking about this plan and he's telling us how everything's going to end. Then the end will come when he hands over, Jesus will hand over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until... God has put all of his enemies under his feet. This is a temporary reign. He must reign until God has put all enemies under his feet. For when God has put everything under his feet, again, uh, quoting Psalm 8, now when it is says that everything has been put under him, this clearly does not include the one who put everything under him. And when all things have been subjected to him, then the son himself will be made subject to to God who put all things under him so that God may be all in all. So that God, one person, may be all in all. So Christ has this temporary reign until all things are reconciled, until all enemies are put under his feet within the created realm alone. And then once he has everything has been put under his feet, he gives his power back to his God and Father so that God who is one person may be all in all. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew Griffin, for that 20-minute opening statement. So, gentlemen, that concludes our 20-minute opening statements for tonight's debate. And we're now moving into 15-minute rebuttals. So these are in, uninterrupted uh, rebuttals. We'll throw it back to you, Anthony. And so whenever you're ready, just make sure to click unmute. It says I can't unmute you from my end. Okay, you're good to go. So you got 15 minutes, Anthony. Floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'm not sure I'll need 15 minutes to respond to that. Uh, hopefully, I'll cover everything. If I forget to, though, Andrew, of course, may feel free to raise the point in our cross-examination. Andrew started his opening presentation, and he asserted the same thing several times intermittently in the be beginning, middle, and end. Uh, saying that the word God never refers to the Trinity. Now, in the first place, we aren't debating the Trinity today, so that's a red herring. Moreover, that's just an assertion, not an argument. So not only is Andrew apparently at times forgetting what the debate is about, but he is forgetting what an argument looks like. The assertions are not arguments. They don't prove anything. It also isn't even true. 
For example, simply compare what's written in Philippians 2 and Romans 14, where both passages quote the same text from Isaiah 45, and yet in Philippians 2, Paul says it's talking about Jesus. In Romans 14, Paul says it's talking about the Father. So there's a obvious example refuting Andrew's claim, his assertion, that the word God never refers to the Trinity. Now, I quite agree that the word God is often just a way of referring to the Father, but that's hardly problematic for me as a Trinitarian. The Father is called God often. The Son is called God as well. Uh, the Son is usually called Lord, and Paul, he's the only one called Lord outside of Old Testament quotations. Even in Old Testament quotations, it's usually Jesus. Forty-five of the times that Paul uses the word Lord from an Old Testament citation 75% of those refer to Jesus. So uh, I'm not sure what Andrew thinks this line of reasoning is supposed to prove, although his point there wasn't even true. He also makes the statement that Jesus has a God, as though this is a refutation of the Christian position. Christians believe that Jesus is both God and man. Since God is God of man, the, va the fact that Christ became man means that by virtue of that, the Father stands in relationship to him in that regard as God. In Jeremiah, it says God is the God of all flesh. In John 1, 1, it calls Jesus God, but says in 14 that he became flesh. And so by virtue of that, Jesus can refer to the Father as his God. Did Andrew miss the many passages that speak of Christ condescending to come into the world, lowering himself, stooping, as it were, Philippians 2, he humbled himself. 1 Corinthians 8, 9, he who is rich for our sakes became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. Over and over again, Scripture speaks of Christ lowering himself, humbling himself. And this isn't something to throw in his teeth, to cast in his face and say, you can't be the God you claim to be because there are all these other things about you that are less than deity. These are the very glories of Christ that we should be singing, that we should be relishing in. He, for us men and our salvation, became flesh. He humbled himself for our sakes. This isn't something to be cast into his face and, and to be used as grounds for disbelieving in his eternal deity. These are the very things for which we ought to fall on our faces and praise him for what he did. When Andrew tried to deal with Colossians 1, 15 through 20, there is, of course, much that he just glossed over there, uh, which is... Uh, something I, we're, we're going to have to get to in the cross-examination. But one of the things he focused on a lot is the fact that Christ is called the image of the invisible God. Now, this is supposed to prove that Christ can't be God because he's the image of the invisible God. But as I already pointed out, God often refers to the Father, and in this case is a reference to the Father. He is the Father's image. And that doesn't mean that Christ isn't also God. Numerous passages refer to him as such. Colossians 2.9 in this very epistle explicitly says so. I'll get to that. But Andrew even gave away the store here. He quoted a scholar saying that Christ is the one who makes the Father visible. So it's in Christ that God makes himself visible. This isn't a disproof of Christ's deity. It's underscoring. I mean, it's, it's assuming Christ's deity. How can he reveal God if he is not himself God? And in, in fact, uh, when you read through the Old Testament in light of this fact that God by nature is invisible, but yet observe that God is appearing at every turn, then you have to ask Andrew and every Unitarian, who is this God who's constantly being seen? You can't say that it's some lesser God. It's the one true God. In Genesis 18, it says, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the Oaks of Mamre. It uses the divine name, Yahweh. Genesis 26, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Later in the chapter, it says, the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I'm the God of your father, Abraham. Genesis 35, God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you. Exodus 3, Moses was told to say to the elders of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. Exodus 24, Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And so given the fact that God in his essence cannot be seen, but nevertheless has made himself palpably seen by people, has manifested himself, who then must this be? Since it's not the Father, Andrew admits it, and I agree, it must be the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Andrew, to try and support his point, even cited John 1, 18, or rather cited half of it, where it says, nobody's seen God at any time. The rest of the verse says, but 
God, the only begotten who's in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. So this expression that Jesus is the image of God is not a way of denigrating his deity, but of saying that he is, by virtue of being the fullness of deity in the flesh, able to reveal the Father. It's the same point Jesus made in John 14. It's the same point, I would argue, that's being made in Hebrews 1, where it refers to him as the effulgence, not effulgence, the effulgence of God's glory, the identical expression of the Father's substance. Now, Andrew also made much of the fact that in 115, Christ is called the firstborn. But this is a way of referring to Jesus as the primogenitor, the one who's the heir of all things, the one to whom everything belongs and to whom all things are subject. It entails rightful possession and sovereignty over everything. And according to God, or the Old Testament, God is the primogenitor, the one who inherits or possesses everything. Uh, for example, uh, it, I, uh, Psalm 82 says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. Even Ephesians, what Andrew admits is a companion text to Colossians, speaks of God's inheritance. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in all the saints. This is why Jews had no problem referring to God as firstborn. There are numerous Jewish sources that refer to him as primogenitor mundi, the, the firstborn of the world, the one to whom everything belongs, the one who is sovereign over it. This term is not a way of limiting Christ. It's a way of saying he's preeminent. That's why the text gives a logical connective there. It doesn't just say he's the image of God, he's the firstborn, so that you can then run off and say it means whatever you want, less than deity. Paul connects this with the word for. For in him all things were created. Now you heard Andrew try and say that because it says in him, in alto, that therefore doesn't mean, and it doesn't matter you know, what he tries to assign to it, uh, whatever kind of uh, construction he or grammar he wants to apply to this here. He says it's used for Jesus, not for the Father. Jesus is never said to be the one from whom is everything. But in Acts 17, 28, the exact same preposition is used for the Father. In him we live and move and have our being. Our very existence is in him. Paul says the same thing here about Jesus. In him all things were created. It's also true that uh, in this text, it says that it's not just in him. It uses three different prepositions, in him, through him, and for him. Two of these three prepositions are used for the Father in Romans eleven thirty six. 36. For of him and through him and to him or for him are all things. So again, the, the idea that this isn't talking about Christ as God and somehow is showing that he's inferior to the Father just doesn't fly. Repeatedly, things are said to be through the Father. This doesn't indicate subordination. In fact, if it did, Andrew would have a whopper of a problem because in uh, Galatians 1.1, as one example, it not only says that uh, Paul was called through Jesus Christ and God the Father, showing that it's through both Father and Son. So who are they subordinate to? Uh, but it's also the case that uh, it says that we do things through God. Psalm 60, verse 12, Psalm 108, 13 says, uh, through God, we shall do valiantly. Since we do these things through God, does that mean he's subordinate to us? Uh, this is just bad exegesis. Uh, Andrew uh, tried to deal with Colossians 2, 9. I, I don't think he did well here at all. He, here's the context of Colossians 2, uh, nine. Prior to it, in verses one through eight, Paul tells the Colossians they're, they're to cling to Christ in faith, for it is in him that one finds all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And being rooted and built up and established in him, they're to withstand all attempts to take them captive through philosophy. Notice Andrew had a good time there quoting Egyptian sources, Hellenistic sources, philosophical sources. Paul says, don't be taken captive through these sources and how they're using language to express their philosophies. He calls it empty deception, deception, which is according to human tradition and the elementary principles of the world. Now, we learn something of what this worldly wisdom or philosophy entailed from what follows when Paul warns believers not to be defrauded or robbed of the treasure they have in Christ by engaging in the angelic worship and asceticism and legalism to which the false teachers were calling them. What these false teachers were advocating is uh, something that started as far back as the wilderness of scenes, uh, which was then blended by some together with elements of Christianity, apparently as early as 
the, the Colossians and Asia Minor, and eventually later developed into the teachings of men like Valentinus and Basilides, which came to be called Gnosticism. The idea is basically this. Hear this carefully. The ultimate being, according to them, to whom belonged the fullness, the pleroma, could have no di direct contact with matter, perceived to be ignoble at best or evil at worst. For that reason, according to them, a series of emanations came forth from that being, one after another, called angels at this stage and eons later in history. Each layer of this series of emanations partook in ever lessening degrees of, of the pleroma until you get to the lowest emanation. Accordingly, by means of avoiding matter and worshiping angels, these false teachers were saying, one could ascend up through them to the pleroma, the fullness, the absolute deity. But in opposition to this, Paul says, in Christ dwells all the fullness, the pleroma of deity. Jesus is not a being inferior to angels, and Jesus is not even greater than angels on Andrew's view. He's not someone far down the ladder of deity who merely partook of some divine qualities. Rather, all the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus. The word theates means absolute godhood. It's the very word for deity. In fact, our debate is, does Colossians teach the deity of Christ? Colossians 2.9 is an exact and direct answer to that. In Christ dwells the deity, all the fullness of deity in bodily form. In fact, you even heard Andrew say a couple of times, I don't know where he gets this, it's not from the grammar, that this is temporarily true of Jesus. Well, not only is he denying that it's actually Jesus who's the embodiment of deity, but he's saying that this is just a temporary thing that God is doing. The very grammar is telling us it's permanent. Paul says, in Christ dwells right now as a present reality, and it does so bodily. And the force of the grammar here is that this is permanent. Christ is the permanent embodiment of deity. So not only is... Uh, Andrew denigrating what it means to call Christ deity. He's also making even this uh, effervescent, I mean, it's just some effervescent quality given to him for a limited time. Okay, this isn't the teaching of Colossians. I'm happy to talk with Andrew about 1 Corinthians 15 and all these other passages that he's bringing up. Right now, we're supposed to be focused on C Colossians. Uh, but the fact is, Colossians doesn't say that. That's also not what those passages teach. Uh, but this uh, refutes, by the way, let me say, not only Unitarians who think of Christ as something other than all the fullness of deity, but it also refutes every other apostate group and cult that teaches that you need to worship or venerate angels and saints in order to be complete or have the fullness of the faith. No, you don't. If you have Christ, then in him you have everything. In him you are complete. If you reject this Christ, either explicitly, as Unitarians do, or by implication, by undermining in, in principle his all-sufficiency, by turning to creatures to supplement your faith, then you have defrauded yourselves. You have been robbed and taken captive by human philosophy and the traditions of men. And so uh, I hope I've dealt with everything Andrew has said. Uh, I'm happy to deal with anything else that he wants to bring up in the next round of rebuttals or during the cross-examination period. But at this point, I'd simply remind Andrew not only that these texts very clearly teach that Christ is the fullness of deity, that Christ is the creator of all things, that all thrones and dominions are subject to him, not only the new creation, he's not only the firstborn from among the dead, he's the firstborn over all creation, and he is before all things, Colossians 1.17. Right now, Christ exists before all things. He made everything. He is the one to whom all of our worship, all of our praise, all of our faith, all of our fear, everything that we do is to be directed. This is the one we were made for. Jesus is the one we were made for. You, you do not do yourself any service by making Jesus less than this all-sufficient Christ that Paul is telling you he is. In Christ dwells all the fullness of deity. Look to him and be made complete in him. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much, Anthony, for that 15-minute rebuttal. I am going to restart the timer. Did I use all 15 minutes? Pretty close. Oh, okay. you got a, a few I thought seconds. I was being magnanimous. <laughs> and here I was just being fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these uh, these time slots fly by. And so I appreciate it. Andrew, we're now going to hand it over to you for your 15-minute uninterrupted rebuttal. And I will start the timer on your first word. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony, for that. Uh, brilliant. 
apologetic demonstration. I'm not sure I'll have 15 minutes to to address these things. I'm not sure it'll take that long, but I'll do my best. Um, and I say apologetic demonstration because Anthony speaks like like most apologists in a, in a sophistic manner where he's trying to persuade you of all of these things. And he takes a lot of assumptions and he throws them all together and sort of pulls the wool over your eyes and in order to, and I say that respectfully, I, I probably shouldn't say that. I, I'll say he's just trying to persuade you, but he takes a lot of assumptions and, and forces them uh, onto us. And uh, this is not how hermeneutics works. Systematically, this is not how hermeneutics works. That's when we're building foundations on which to build our theology, we should have sound hermeneutical principles, such as the clear fact that Anthony, he tried to try to say that, oh, no, God does equal the Trinity. Maybe he doesn't understand. What, what I'm saying is that anytime we read the title God, it does not equal Trinity. What he's saying is that, oh, well, these verses apply to different persons and they're all the Trinity. Therefore, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the title God never equals Trinity. I don't I don't know if, if I can make that much more clear. Um, and he, he talks about things I didn't establish. Okay, well, let's let's see this, because when I talk about Jesus having a God, what does he say? He says, well, the incarnation is OK because the Christian position is. What is he doing there? He's bringing suppositions. He's bringing a presuppositional doctrine to the text, which is a big no, no, in in hermeneutics, it shouldn't bring you presuppositions to the text. He doesn't demonstrate from the book of Colossians, especially that there's some incarnation here. He doesn't prove it from anywhere, uh, but especially Colossians, the book that we're talking about here. He brings this presupposition and and says, "Well, it's okay that Jesus has a God because the, the Christian position is." And then has these, this presuppositional doctrine, which he forces on the text. And this is what I said in my opening, that you can't look at this clear, explicit hermeneutical fact that Jesus has one person who is his God. He has a God over him. We can't just dismiss that with pre, pre, presuppositions. He didn't prove it from the book of Colossians. Okay. And he talks about uh, that... Andrew doesn't believe that Jesus is greater than the angels. It was a complete straw man. That's not what I said. In fact, I said the opposite of it. I said that everything we need and all power was given to Jesus Christ. This is what the whole uh, Hebrews 1 is about, about Jesus being superior to angels. Why on God's green earth would I deny that Jesus is greater than the angels? So he's built a straw man, knocked it down. Congratulations. But if you want to address my actual arguments, we'd make a lot more progress. It talks about Colossians 2.9. That's now a present reality. I agree. The resurrected Christ, it is now a reality. And what Paul is saying here is that it's found in him, and it's not going anywhere else. You'll never need to look among angels or powers in the heavens to find what you need. Everything that you need is centrally located in one place in the person of Jesus. But when we read 1 Corinthians 15, we see that this is temporary. He's given this power in order to accomplish a mission, which is the reconciliation of all things in the created realm, that is in the heavens and on the earth. And once that's done, he gives the power back to God the Father. Is that not what we read? He says he must reign, which means he has this particular power, until something happens. That is a moment of time. This is not speaking about an eternal nature. Okay. And he talks about John 1.18. Again, this is where apologetics comes in and not hermeneutics, because anyone who practiced actual hermeneutics would know that that was a, 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 a terrible uh, translation of John 118. No one has ever seen God. This is a clear biblical fact, and you're going to have to deal with it. There's somebody who's never been seen. Now, if we want to talk about how God's seen and things like this, that's a, kind of a separate conversation. Nevertheless, there's a figure within the book of Colossians who's referred to as the invisible God, and he's one person, and he's addressed all throughout the New Testament as the one who nobody has ever seen or can see, and he's the invisible God, and he's the God of Jesus. Jesus being the image of God, 
means he makes God known. Anthony says, well, how in the world would he ever make him known unless he is God himself? He reflects God's character. Anthony assumes that Jesus is the angel of the Lord and all these things. He says, well, how is it that God's seen? Now he's off in speculative land. And instead of demonstrating something, he likes to force it on this text when it doesn't even really belong because we're dealing with the book of Colossians. We talk about the image of the invisible God. He represents, and then he says something that I think is hilarious, respectfully, respect Anthony a lot, I'm not trying to be rude. He's, he says that, well, Andrew's talking about, oh, what, what the image of God meant in Egyptian culture. Well, number one, this is a part of the, mic problems, mic problems. This is a part of, a critical part in the hermeneutical process to understand the culture in which the Bible was written in. And he compares that with, with vain philosophy that Paul's talking about in Colossians 2. It has nothing to do with each other. Gra gathering cultural context to understand what these books would have meant to the original audience has nothing to do with vain philosophy. I don't even know how he, how he uh, brings that together. And he talks about, you know, I'll, I'll go to his opening presentation now talks about how there's one Lord in heaven. Okay. If there's if, if God is one Lord and Jesus is one Lord, then that's two Lords. Okay. But we read in Acts 2.36 that therefore let all Israel know with certainty that God, who is one person, has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. So Jesus being Lord is something that he was made. You would never make God Lord. He is Lord. He is the supreme power. He is sovereign eternally. He doesn't need to be made anything. He doesn't need to be given all, all of these things. Within the created realm, God gave free will. Things went astray and they're being reconciled back to him. But God has ultimate power. He is the almighty. Something that's never said about Jesus. All right. And he talks about how uh, Paul call, uh, never refers to the Father as Lord. Okay, so let's look then if that's true. We see in, let's see, 1 Timothy 6, where it's talking about the Father. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus. Hermeneutically, you're never going to say that Jesus is God there. There's one God who gives life to all things and another person who is Christ Jesus. Keep this commandment without standing reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus, which the blessed and only sovereign one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, will bring about in his own time. The Father is clearly called Lord. Not only that, he's called the Lord of lords. Jesus is made Lord. The Father is the Lord of Jesus. He's the has the power over Jesus. Jesus calls him Lord. Okay. And so again, it says he alone, speaking about this one person who is the Lord of all lords and the blessed and only sovereign one who alone is immortal and dwells in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen him, nor can anyone see him. Proving again and demonstrating Unitarian hermeneutics. All right. Again, Christ is made uh, power over. He's the head of uh, all, all created beings. Christ is second in power only to God. Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians. When all things are put under him, of course it doesn't mean God. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. God is the head of Christ. We have to understand the power structure. Okay? All right, he speaks about Colossians 3.17. Okay, he talks about uh, giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus Christ. So where is the thanks going to, and how is it getting there? It doesn't say thanks to the Trinity. It doesn't say thanks to God the Son. All the thanks is going to God the Father. Jesus says to, uh, to honor the Son is to honor the one who sent him, again showing his subordination. And so we have to understand the power structure and how it works when someone acts as a vice regent, which the king did. 
Okay. And again, when we see Colossians 2 9, Anthony was speaking about Colossians 2 9, about how God, all of God's fullness dwelt in Zion. Where, and so on Zion, the presence, the fullness of God dwelt in the temple. That is what Christ is. He is the temple. And what does that mean? That means that Christ is the locus of God's revelation and presence. Christ as the eschatological world, he's seen as risen up and, and replacing the physical temple and being the, the, the locus of God's revelation and presence. And again, if God dwelt on Zion, never would we say because God dwelt on Zion that Zion is God. So if God dwells in the person of Jesus in some way, we shouldn't say that Jesus is God because God dwells in him. We have to understand what that means, that God dwells in him. Context tells us that this refers to revelation and wisdom and power that is found in him that makes God known so that people can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. This is speaking about a way that you should act and you should behave and how you should approach God. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And so all of this power is in him, centrally located in one place. Currently, he wants to speak about the grammar. I agree. As the resurrected Christ, all of this power, whatever the theotetos is, one, it was given to him, and two, is in him now after he was resurrected Paul says that this fullness was, God was pleased to have his fullness, one person's fullness, not three persons' fullness, one person's fullness dwelled in him. And so if he wants to bring up the Trinity, well, I assume you're a Trinitarian, that's fine. Leave the Trinity out of it. God is one person. He, he was pleased to dwell on Zion. This one person dwelled on Zion, and never would we say that Zion is God because God dwelt there. We have to understand what the activity What's going on in the temple? It was God's presence and God's revelation in the temple. That's the significance. And I will uh, stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrew, for that 15-minute rebuttal. Gentlemen, that concludes our 20-minute openings and also our 15-minute rebuttal. So we're moving along smoothly, and we got... A lot of points on the table for everybody's favorite part of these formal debates, the cross-exam. And so we got 15 minutes each for the cross-examination. And Andrew just ended with his 15-minute rebuttal. So, Anthony, we are going to hand it back to you to lead the way for the first 15 minutes. Gentlemen, go ahead. All right, it's my turn first. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, all right, so... Quickly, Andrew, um, several times in the book of Acts, not to mention elsewhere, it speaks of Paul seeking to persuade men. Even the king says, would you seek to persuade me in such a short time? Do you think that Paul was doing something wrong before God by doing that? I'm trying to figure out what this has to do with Colossians. Well, I'll help you out in a minute. Just do, do you think there's anything wrong with that? He's trying to persuade him. Can you do you want to provide some context? Yeah, he was trying to persuade the king, for example, to believe in Jesus. He went into the synagogues trying to persuade oh, so, Jews to believe in no, Jesus. I wouldn't think no, absolutely not. Okay, thank you. So then when you accused me of doing something illicit by trying to persuade and be an apologist and so forth, you were just doing that to take a shot. All right. So um you said that uh, 1 Timothy 6 is talking about the Father as Lord. Will you go to 1 Timothy 6 with me for a moment? Sure. I'm there. Okay, so in verse 14, just prior, it says, mm -hmm. you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So who's Paul mentioned there, for example? The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Then he says, which he will bring about at the proper time. So here he uses the pronoun. Who's the antecedent of the pronoun? No, it's it, this, that's a reference to God. I, I, I didn't ask you what you think. I'm asking you who's the grammatical antecedent of the pronoun. 
why don't you tell us what you think? You just told me what it is. Verse 14 mentions Jesus. It doesn't say the Father. And then it says which he will bring about at the appointed time. So who's the antecedent? I mean, if your point is that you wanted to say this was a reference to Jesus in the rest of the passage, just say that's it. Just, I mean, we don't yeah, want to play good, games. No, yeah. that's good hermeneutics. I'm just helping you to see that. So he's uh, this person is also called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Do you think there's a person named Jesus who's called that in the Bible? Do you think Nebuchadnezzar is? Yeah, of course. Okay, do you think that's who Paul's talking about here? No, but these titles okay. don't... So he mentions nothing. Jesus. He's the immediate mm -hmm. antecedent. And so pointing to this text about the invisible one who dwells in unapproachable light is not a proof that it's about the Father. So you need a better text if you're going to try and find something like that. Now, I mean, the fact of the matter is what I said is not really contested by scholars, not even Unitarian scholars. James Dunn, other scholars make the same point. Paul does not use the word Lord for anyone other than Jesus outside of Old Testament quotations. And most of the Old Testament citations are about uh, Jesus anyways. Now, uh, you had an issue with the word God being used for more than one person. That's what we mean by the Trinity, that God is more than one person. Did you understand my point about Isaiah 45 being quoted in two places in the New Testament for two different persons? Sure. So do you understand how that's not Unitarianism? Yes, but that wasn't that wasn't my that wasn't my what I'm trying to argue for. You're, what, what, you're saying what, that one text, you're saying one text that was ascribed to Yahweh is ascribed to Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is Yahweh. No, no, no. Uh, I'm saying oh. it's applied to both father and son. So you have the same singular term God being used for both father and son. The same exact term, the same exact no, text. No, it, you have an Old Testament reference used oh. in the New Testament. So how they use it in the New Testament doesn't always mean that's how it was used in the Old Testament. This oh, is, so you're accusing, the, is you're accusing the, the apostles of misciting the Old no, Testament? that's just how hermeneutics works. You can, oh, that's how hermeneutics, okay. So we know how is, hermeneutics yeah. works it's for called, Andrew. It's called <laughs> New Testament use of the Old Testament. No, that's how yeah, which I think is faithful, are. which I think is faithful to the Old Testament. Okay, Apparently, you think you that, but that's just an opinion. You're not proving anything. Wait, wait, wait. So, but, but let's at least be clear then. You think that the New Testament authors play fast and loose with the Old Testament. I don't. Okay. okay. So you said, uh, well, let me ask you this. So in uh, Deuteronomy 33, for example, it says the Lord became king in Jeshurun. Do you believe that? Jeshurun is an old way of referring to Israel. I think we need to look at the context to understand exactly what's being said. Okay, you want to look at the context? I'll wait. I mean, I know what the context is, but it's Deuteronomy 33. It's talking about how God well, became king over Israel. You're, you're approaching these questions. You're trying to lead and sort of set a trap. If you have something it, you want to say it, in good it, Christian faith, why don't you just say it? There, just there, say look, what you're trying to lead all, me into. All right, wait a minute. If you have an honest, sincere answer, you don't have to worry about falling into a trap. Well, you're playing I don't a mind game. if you ask me questions. It's but you're not playing a game. games. Deuteronomy, game. 33, playing games. Deuteronomy 33 says the Lord became king in Jeshurun. How does this pertain to Colossians, what we're debating? Because here? you're trying to make a point about Jesus being made Lord, becoming Lord, and so forth. Of course, through the resurrection of Christ, he comes to exercise yeah, lordship even yeah. over people who are in rebellion to him. It doesn't mean that he wasn't Lord prior to that. In fact, in Luke 2, when Jesus is conceived, Luke calls him Lord, so he was Lord prior to the resurrection. I'm just showing you that okay. your hermeneutic is flawed. Okay, that's my point. Okay. And it's okay. not just Deuteronomy 33. There are other passages. Okay. How about this one? First Chronicles 29. It's uh, Revelation 4. I'll, I'll use this one. It says, uh, the Lord is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. How can God, the Lord, receive glory, honor, and power? Context. Again, these are these are just apologetic approaches. What do you mean apologetic this approaches? This is these, apologetic these, games. Okay, I mean, these are all in the Bible. All in the Bible. There shouldn't know. be a problem for your theology. All right. So I've established that Jesus is called Lord in the New Testament by Paul. And I didn't really hear you dealing with the passages I brought up showing how Paul identifies Christ as Lord. In Colossians 4, he refers to Christ as the Lord in heaven. How do you think any Jew would have understood that? I don't, it doesn't matter how, it matters what the author meant, not how a Jew would okay. have understood how, it. How about Paul the Jew? How do you think Paul the Jew would have understood this? Why do you think Paul was so upset with the early Christians for talking this way? You don't know? It's, it's not an Hero argument. You're, you're not the making an God. argument. You're not the making Lord an argument. I'm you, asking you, a you're, question. You're, <laughs> That's This is a question and answer period. And you keep, I, I think, just running from the questions. All right. Um. So Paul calls Jesus the Lord who is in heaven, the Lord who all men are to serve and who will judge all without partiality. 
Do you not recognize the echoes here to Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 10? It's the one Lord who is in heaven in Deuteronomy 6 that men are to confess that they're to serve and who doesn't show partiality. How do you think Paul is using the word Lord here for Jesus? In light of this Old Testament background. Following the, the whole Bible and, and how we understand things, Acts 2.36 says that God, <laughs> who is one person, made Jesus the Lord. I'm just giving you an answer. If you don't like it, that's fine. Deuteronomy 33 says God became king in Jeshurun. Revelation 4 says God receives okay. glory God and God is not a power. man. God is not said to be a man who was Jesus. a literal king. This is metaphoric, biblical, me, uh, metaphoric language. And so you're confusing metaphors with reality. That's the difference. Jesus wait, a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying that whenever language is used in the Old Testament that I'm citing, it's just metaphorical. I'm saying when, and then okay. when it's used in the New Testament, well, it's irrelevant. Did God have a physical king uh, crown on his head? Was God on earth actually dwelling as king? No, I don't then think, it's metaphoric I don't think language. Jesus did, I don't think Jesus had a crown on his head either. I don't even know what your argument's supposed to prove there. All right, but, but let's move on. So you don't have an answer for that correlation. Jesus is the Lord in heaven, whom all men are to serve, and... Uh, He's the one who doesn't show partiality, just like Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 10 say. Is that in a question? Colossians 3.12, I'm just pointing out that you didn't have an answer to that question. No, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that anything, and I'm telling you, and as I said in my presentation, any power that Jesus had was because God gave it to him. That's the clear uh, language of the Bible. That's the clear language. Where, where does Paul say in Colossians that power was given to Jesus? In fact, so you, you see, where, you like to, you like to go to Deuteronomy, where, but then I'm limited to Colossians. But, in, I, but no, fact, no, I'm every using, single every single question you've asked is outside of Colossians. No, no, I'm asking in light of the Old Testament background. Paul's writing with that in the background, so I can stick to Colossians. But I, I'm happy to do this. Why don't you show me a text in the Bible where it talks about Jesus being given power? Are you saying it doesn't exist? I mean, I'm, a, I'm asking? asking you for a text. <laughs> uh, Matthew, uh, I think, 28, 18, the Great Commission. Jesus what's says, the, after he was resurrected, there? all power and authority has been given to me. What's the term used there? Okay. Are you saying it's not? He has. Are you saying okay. it's not power? So, is that, is that your argument? Questions. I'll come back to that in my rebuttal. All right. So uh, Colossians 3, 12 through 13 says that Jesus is the Lord who forgives. According to the Old Testament, who is the Lord to whom mercies and forgiveness belong? God. Okay, so if Jesus is the Lord who forgives, who is Jesus? He's been empowered. Where does do it things. say that? He's an authorized agent. The whole Bible where, where, is filled where does, with it. Where does it say that Jesus, as the Lord who forgives, was empowered to forgive? Well, this is how hermeneutics works. You have to understand well, you how can't a just high... tell me that's how hermeneutic works. Show me yeah. this in action. Give me, give me the hermeneutics in action. Show me where it says Jesus was given the okay. power to well, forgive. Well, to understand the, the topic about Jesus forgiving sins, hermeneutically, you have to understand how he works as a high priest and, and the priest being able to authorize to forgive sins. Where does it say the priest forgives sins? This is this is just how atonement works. <laughs> You're saying that. Where does it say that in the Bible? We need Bible. That's how hermeneutics works. You keep telling me I'm reading things into the Bible. I'm presupposing. Wait, which, I, but you're just off in left field. I mean, we're not even talking about. The, we are. Colossians 3.12. It's a very shallow argument. Jesus, if it's so shallow, you shouldn't have trouble swimming here. You should be swimming like an Olympic pro. Okay. Jesus is the Lord who forgives sins. According to the Old Testament, there's only one Lord who forgives sins. Against you only I have sinned. To you belong mercies and forgiveness, not to the other gods. Okay, so no answer to that one. Jesus was, I, my answer is that Jesus was given the power and that's, the authorization to do it. That's your okay. assertion. Where does okay. it say he was given that's the power answer. to forgive? All throughout the New Testament, it talks about the power that he was oh. given, how he, how he does okay. nothing of his own. He, everything is, is from his God. Okay, so I'll come to that. All right. So uh, in Colossians 4, it refers to believing in Jesus, putting our faith in Jesus, trusting in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Does the Old Testament permit people putting their trust in, taking refuge in others? Who knows? I know. What, what, Cursed is he who trusts in man. Cursed is he who trusts in princes. Cursed is he who trusts in Egypt. Cursed is he who trusts in horses. You're to trust only in the Lord, according to the Bible. That's okay. That's okay. So, okay. yeah. So Colossians 1 4 says we're to have faith in Christ. Okay. And along with this, <clears throat> says we're to serve him from the heart and all the rest. Again, just Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 10 stuff. All right. So let's go to the stuff that you focused on which is Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Uh, 
you made much of the use of the preposition in him. You acknowledge now, I assume, that the same preposition is used for the Father in Acts 17, 28? Sure. Okay. Do you also realize now that there's three prepositions used there? I do. In him, through him, for him? Yep. yep. Okay. So what does it mean to say all things were created through him? Uh, well, as David Powell points out in his exegetical commentary, that the through and for him explicate what we're reading in verse 16, the in him. And so in order to understand these through and for him, which are explicating what we're reading in verse 16, we first have to understand what Paul's saying in verse 16, which I demonstrated in my opening. <laughs> Demonstrate it to me again. I didn't get it. In what does Christ. it mean to say all things were created through him and for him? So, so well, Paul's just being redundant? Yes, he's 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 uh, expounding on what he's talking about in verse sixteen. That's okay, correct. so so how does he expound it? What does it mean? Through him can through also him mean him. with him in mind, and it's unto him. All things were created in him. That through means, him through him means with him in mind. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Because, what, what is that? What is that use of uh, through him called then in Greek? <laughs> I'm genuinely puzzled. I mean, that's just not what the phrase through him means. It can mean that there's no okay, there's so, no concrete so, there's no concrete oh yes, meaning there is. Of, so, well there's there, not there's there, not. there is there is a limited range of meanings certain okay and, and one of the ranges is to mean, mean because of him it's is not what through him means it is okay so then in revelation or romans eleven thirty six it says all things were made through him and for him referring to the father so are you saying all things were made with the father in mind you're, you're ripping things out of context. Well, I mean, wait a minute. Why, why does it suddenly mean? Because you act like as if it, these things have these concrete rules, which we have to apply every single place in Scripture, and that's not how exegesis or hermeneutics work. Okay, what's the difference? Depending on the context. context. What's the difference between the two contexts that makes it mean one thing in Ro Ro Romans 11.36 and another thing because in Colossians 1? God created all things through his wisdom. For Paul, Christ was that wisdom. Okay, is okay. wisdom some impersonal thing? It is. What, on what basis do you say wisdom is impersonal rather than a personal title of Christ? A personal t God, Christ became to us wisdom. Number one, that, he, says he, that, that, that means for us, though. It doesn't mean that he became wisdom. Okay. Wis so what you're arguing that wisdom is an actual person. Is that what you're arguing? Absolutely. That's Roman. well, we can, we can debate that, but yeah, I, well, I don't think any, if it's any actual your argument, then you actually have to give a, an evidence for it. <laughs> Uh, because it talks about how wisdom dwells with prudence, it's poetic language. No serious scholar is going to entertain the idea that wisdom uh, is every is every Christian scholar for 1,900 years took it that way. Newsflash, well, yeah, that's hey, just that's, a fact. Like Even a the Arians to took it that way. So when you say no serious scholar, I'm just depriving you of the fact that you apparently don't know the history of okay, scholars. You're talking scholars. about church fathers and Arius as if they're scholars, and, and oh. they're not. They're, they're early <laughs> Christian all, thinkers. First they're of not all, scholars. these were people that this was their native language, Okay. first of all. So they had quite a leg up on many other people. Okay. Uh, but they also weren't prejudiced by a lot of modern conceptions. They, In fact, they knew the historical context far better than you do. Talk about okay. historical context. All right. Well, so Paul says that all things were created uh, through Christ and for Christ. He also says in verse 17, he is before all things. What do you mm -hmm. think that means? He has That's the last question, gentlemen. Go ahead, Andrew. He has eminence uh, for all things. Uh, that is creation and the church. That's what Paul says. No, he says he is before all things right he now. He is before all things right now. Yes, he is. He has eminence so he, over everything in the created order and the church. That's what Paul says. Where, if Paul wanted to say preeminence rather than temporal priority over all temporal reality, he would have used an entirely different preposition. Okay. Anyways, so, go ahead. Okay, gentlemen, very fast-paced uh, first 15 minutes. I do appreciate it. Uh, to the audience, keep sending in those questions. Very good. I'm appreciating all the... Uh, engagement in our lively live chat tonight. So I am going to restart the timer. We got our second 15 minute round of cross exam. And so Andrew, you get to lead the way and gentlemen, the floor is yours again. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, Anthony. You're welcome. Is Jesus the invisible God? Yes. And in the incarnation, he became visible. The okay. word became flesh. Okay. 
it talks about the these uh, things that were created and it speaks about thrones dominions authorities powers things like this do you accept what i proposed from uh, walter wink about these referring to positions of power um even right. if they're used metonymically for people who occupy those positions uh both heavenly and earthly uh being heavenly powers and ter earthly terrestrial powers that were created in christ so what Paul's doing there, and, and you can tell me if this is what the, the quote means that you were giving, but what Paul's doing, he's not even explicitly endorsing this order of beings. He's, he's addressing the heresy of the Colossians that was infiltrating the Colossian church, where they were positing all these beings, this hierarchy of beings. And he says, all things were created through him and for him, whether in heaven, on earth, visible or invisible, whether there be or are thrones or dominions or principalities. He's just saying whatever mm. the orders of beings are in mm. this hierarchy, yep. they were all made through Christ. That's OK. That's so you, you say order of beings. And, and so 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 it says in Christ, all things were created, whether. So so were these things created in Christ? In whatever actually, it is. Paul's, or, Paul, or is Paul's he just point is. Paul's, well, okay. first of all, before that, before he even says that, he says, in him all things were created, whether in heaven or on earth, or in heaven or on earth, or both in heaven and on earth is how he says it, okay. uh, visible and invisible. And then he says, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities. But all I'm pointing out is Paul's making this statement that everything came through Christ. So whatever kinds of angelic beings sure. there are, they were all made through Jesus. But what I'm trying to get at is what exactly these things are. And, and your opinion and your understanding of what they are. So after much examination on these texts, uh, I agree with Walter Wink when he says that these refer both to heavenly positions of power and earthly terrestrial positions of power. And I'm asking, do you agree with that? I would say he's referring to the beings that are called by, these are terms for these beings. It, if you look at the, the first century literature, it's all throughout the first century literature. You want to talk about historical context. This is how certain groups referred to different orders of angelic beings in these uh, hierarchical systems. So all okay. I'm saying is whatever kinds of beings exist, no matter where they're at in the hierarchy, Jesus made them. Okay. So earthly beings, what earthly beings would he be talking about? So, I mean, any being that's made that has positions of authority, those terms are used in which, some cases. Which before. particular ones from the Bible would he be talking about? What earthly beings were had a position of power, according to Colossians? Uh, well, well, as one example, he, it, in Luke, uh, talks about God casting rulers from their thrones. It uses one of the terms used here in Colossians. Was it speaking uh, about heavenly rulers or earthly rulers? Well, in that case, it would be it would be an earthly ruler, but they're not all earthly rulers here. Okay, so which earthly it, it, rulers? It's the same speaking term, about, uh -huh. it's the yeah, same get, term mm -hmm. used in Ephesians 6, where Paul talks about spiritual powers and authorities and so forth. So it okay. certainly has reference not only to earthly beings, if they're included, but also to heavenly beings. I think the primary okay, so, focus is on heavenly beings, okay. because Paul's counteracting angelic well, but, worship in but Colossians 2. But he talks about also earthly thrones and powers, which you're saying refer to earthly thrones and power positions of power held by earthly people i'm assuming no, no, I, I don't he, he what paul says he says all things were created both in the heavens and on earth through jesus visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities he right, doesn't Anthony, tell us he doesn't I, tell us not, the domain but that these beings occupy he says earthly no, so, yeah in the prior sentence and then you says, talk about how luke says him. You said that Luke says rulers were cast down saying, off their thrones and said it refers to earthly rulers. Are you changing I'm your saying, mind now? No, no. I'm saying if if you want to talk about any of these terms, how they're used in the Bible, sometimes it does refer to earthly beings. I have no problem with I'm that. I'm asking you in this hymn here that Paul's saying, he talks about earthly powers. And you say and that he, these he are... You, listen, powers. I'm, I'm, let me finish. It does. It says powers and thrones and dominions, whether in heaven or earth no, or on the earth. Swapped, you just swapped the order. That is not what it says. It doesn't matter what order you put them in. These are positions <laughs> of power. Okay. It doesn't matter. You know, what, okay, whatever, I'll, just, whatever these I'll make up whatever order I want. You say that these are orders of beings. Okay. And then you say that these are orders of beings which are on the earth and in heaven. They're just, he's, he's contrasting. Say that they exist both in heaven and on the earth. Are you, are you denying that? I'm here. Let me help you out again. Okay. Here's what Paul I, said. I, I wish you would just answer all the things question. were created in him, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. 
Then he talks about thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. He doesn't Correct. tell us where these thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities He's, are. He does. He says both he heavenly doesn't, he and doesn't earthly. Say earthly powers or heavenly powers. I do think that these are primarily heavenly powers because that's primarily, how he's if, if, Okay, if they're primarily, then what's the rest of it? Well, I, I'm happy it's, if you want to say, say it's it all primarily first. heavenly beings. Okay. I probably I agree with you. You know, but I don't I'm know why you're wasting you. so much time I'm, I'm, here. I'm saying I'm, because I'm it's happy important. to concede. If you want to say it also refers to earthly power, so, so it doesn't matter. So you don't know. You don't know. I, no, I don't care. Matter, if it doesn't saying, matter. Okay. All was made through Jesus. Yes or no? Is it talking about earthly beings? I'm happy to concede that it is. Jesus is the one who okay, made good. them. Okay, good. So which earthly beings? Is you, you think this is referring to the Genesis creation account? So which earthly beings is Paul talking about that came about as a result of the Genesis creation account? Who was it that was given dominion over all creation? Are you, are you saying Adam? Oh, that's an example. Gee, okay. Adam was made. He was given dominion over creation. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, okay. But You're so welcome. Adam, but you don't have any re actually actual, uh, you don't have any actual texts which speak about these things. You're saying Adam was given you, you're, thrones. You're and asking me and... if it includes earthly rulers and so forth. Who could it possibly mean? Well, okay, well, well you, you talked about Genesis creation okay. account, Genesis one. Okay, so you, so you see these. What does so dominion you, mean? So you see these as orders of beings and not positions of power. Is that what you're saying? Yes or no? no? I don't. I don't think those are two contrary things. Okay. All right. Uh, you, you talk about Christ being firstborn. Is that something that is inherent to his nature? Yeah, that's the whole point. For okay. is, all things were created, okay. both the heavens and on the earth. Paul gives the explanation okay. for the term. Okay, is God the firstborn? Is, is, I, is God so the Father the, the firstborn? So I made the point that the term firstborn here is being used in the sense of primogenitor, the one who's the heir of all things. Do you agree but with I'm that? Asking you, you said that it's something that's inherent to his nature. So I'm asking you, is the Father also the firstborn? As that well, Being the firstborn is inherent to his nature. That's what I'm asking, yes or no? So, so in the sense that the term refers to this one as the one who's the heir of all things, God is the heir of all things, according to Psalm 82, numerous other passages. Deuteronomy 33 says God is, is God the, the firstborn. Is God the Father? Firstborn. If, if firstborn is, is being firstborn, firstborn, something that's inherent to God the if, Father's if nature. Firstborn is being used in the sense of inheritor, in the sense of the one who's sovereign over everything. There's no problem using the term. Jews use the term for God mm -hmm. as a okay. matter of fact. Okay. Okay. So you're saying that God is referred to as the firstborn in Jewish literature, absolutely, and well, all which, the meaning... which Jewish literature. Well, for example, if you look at J.B. Lightfoot's commentary, he's got all sorts of quotations. You can go check those out. J.B. Lightfoot was a stalwart okay. scholar of the 1900s. All right. Uh, the, the fullness of 119, do you agree that this is the same fullness being spoken about in Colossians 2.9? Yes. Okay. And you, you said that God, you, you, you pointed out as well the, the comparison in Psalm 68 where God was pleased to dwell in Zion, right? Yes, and God dwelt in the temple on Zion. Correct. Yes. Was the temple God? Because was the temple God because God dwelled in it? That's like asking: Is the body of Christ deity because God is personally dwelling there? Okay. Jesus is the fullness of deity in bodily form. He's incarnate. Okay. So your argument and, there is just falls and and what 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 do you believe the theotetos is that's said to dwell in Christ? What do you believe it is Th that? term means deity that's the simplest mm -hmm. translation of the term which if means you want, what if you if which you want what? well first of all you should know that because it's in the title of our debate i know it i know oh, it good. i'm asking good, you good, what good. you mean by it okay so uh well there's only but, one it's an abstract question noun, okay. is what does paul mean here and there's no question the term is not the term theotes which means divine quality or something along those lines. It refers to the state or nature of being God. Thayer's lexicon says it refers to the mm -hmm. divine nature, the divine substance. Okay. Uh, Trench's synonyms says that it refers to godhood. Okay. So it's saying and, uh, absolute is, godhood. Is the Theotetos a person? It says that Christ is the fullness of deity. So is the Theotetos that is said to dwell in Christ a person? Yes or no? I, I think you're you're conflating things, though. The, the Father has the fullness of deity. Okay, but you talked about Jesus having a body, being a human being, mm -hmm. and you said something dwells in him. Is what dwells in him a person, yes or no? 
He is the person in whom the fullness dwells. Okay, so a person's inside of another person. No, no, no. You're confused. No, you're confused. That's your assertion. Refute me. Spider-Man pointing fingers at each other. All right. <laughs> uh, so, I, so you're saying that Jesus is a human person, correct? Or you say he would say he's a divine, Jesus divine is person. A divine person. Okay, sure. But all these things are said to dwell bodily, meaning in a body. So, so what it says is in four, it's actually giving an explanation for the prior verses for or because in him. So this is the rationale for what came before. Hold fast to Christ alone, not angels or anything else, because in him dwells in mm -hmm. him personal pronoun, dwells the fullness of deity, godhood, divine nature. Okay. So is it something or someone that dwells in him? Uh, again, you're missing the point. It's talking about his no, nature. I'm asking so you. It is an abstract noun, but it's talking about his okay. nature. So is, God it has, is it something it or someone? Is, when it says God has deity or God is deity, mm -hmm. you can ask, is deity being used there in a personal way or not? God is a person, but the divine nature is, you could talk about it abstractly, but obviously God's not an abstraction. It is abstract. An abstract. That's yeah, correct. God's you, not make an abstract. It seem, you make it seem as if it's so abundantly clear because Thayer's Greek lexicon said so, but now not you're saying it's abstract. And you're, you're sort of sw you're no, 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 no. Abstract okay. doesn't mean unclear. Don't well, one more. equivocate on me. Abstract just means that something is uh, not I, concrete, I, okay. not physical. Okay. It, you're right. That is, it, I'm not saying it's so clear that you'll never see it, but it's it, abstract. Is the, that's the very definition of what abstract means. But let's move abstract on. One, one last question. Abstract is clear. Okay. Uh, last question. Jesus says that all authority and power was given to me in Matthew 28, 18. When was this authority and power given to him? So we have to go back to the points that I was making before that Scripture, first of all, it speaks about God as king over all things by virtue of creation, but it also speaks of the world rebelling against God and needing to be subdued to him in a redemptive way. This is the whole point of what's going on in the Old Testament, what it's working up to in Christ, what Christ accomplishes. When God subdues Israel to himself, it talks about him becoming Lord over them, becoming king over them, receiving authority over them. Not because he inherently lacked these things before, but because they need to be realized in a redemptive way. That's all that's being said with respect to Christ. The same Christ who receives all authority in heaven and on earth as the risen Lord to apply redemption to his church and to subdue all things to himself is the same one who already had all authority by virtue of being God from the beginning of the gospel account. Matthew 1 starts by calling Christ Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. So at the end of the account, when it talks about him being raised in our nature and having all authority, it's now with respect to him as the risen Lord and for the purpose of redemption and extending his kingdom. So that language, which is already used for God, can't be used to overturn his clear deity. The same language is used for God in the Old Testament. So when Jesus says, all authority and power was given to me, mm -hmm. when was that given to him? That's what I'm mm -hmm. asking you. Oh, okay. It, well... So in this sense, I would say it's talking about upon his resurrection. Okay, thank you. I'm done there. Okay, gentlemen, that is time for the cross exam. So appreciate it. Very uh, fast paced, very engaging. Uh, we do have our 10 minute counter rebuttals though. So to the audience, we have 10 minute counters five minute closings, and then audience questions. So make sure if you do have a question on tonight's topic, the deity of Christ, specifically does Colossians teach the deity of Christ? Make sure you're sending those in. Okay, so Anthony, you get the first 10 minute counter rebuttal. And so the floor is yours whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. I love a good rousing discussion. And I especially like somebody who can engage in a rousing discussion without whining. And Andrew is always good for that. I've not experienced that with everybody I've debated. They think these are uh, kit gloves or patty cake sessions rather than getting down to brass tacks and talking about these important life and death issues. Well, in my opening presentation, I established two facts that 
form and inform the background of Paul's thinking about Jesus and what he says in the epistle to the Colossians. I pointed out that for Paul as a Jew, there is but one Lord to whom everyone owes their absolute allegiance. There's one Lord that all men are to love and serve with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. They're to fear him alone, walk in him alone, serve him alone with all their hearts. He's the one who shows no partiality. He's the one in whose name they're to swear. They're to do everything in his name. I also pointed out that this same Paul is the one who had a radical transforming encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ that further informed his understanding of this Lord that he knew about from the Old Testament scriptures. On that occasion, Jesus knocked him to the ground in a dazzling uh, you know, display of light from heaven and identified himself to Paul as Lord. And from that time on, Paul ever and anon refers to him and to him alone as Lord even and especially when he's citing the Old Testament when it uses the divine name. I, I also pointed out that in this connection, the very language and the order of the account is given, in, especially in Acts 26, matches or mirrors that found in Ezekiel 1, which was clearly the Lord who appeared to Ezekiel. So we have no question in light of this who the Lord is for Paul. It's Jesus. And he understands this Jesus to be that same Lord who had made himself known to his forefathers. With that in mind, I pointed out that in 14 occasions, Paul refers to Jesus as Lord in the book of Colossians. And he does so in ways that clearly echo this Old Testament background. I pointed out in Colossians 4, Jesus is identified as the master who is in heaven over all earthly lords and masters. Andrew had no adequate answer to this. I even pointed out how the very language that's used here in talking about Christ as the Lord of heaven is an echo of Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 10. It, it says that we are to please him as Lord rather than men. It says that we are to serve him as Lord. Uh, it, it says that uh, he is the one for whom we're to work heartily with all our heart. Uh, he's the one who doesn't show partiality. All this is just dripping with the Old Testament. And so for somebody to miss this connection is to simply miss the whole kit and caboodle. It's to show that they don't have ears to hear. They don't have their ear closely to the text of Scripture. That word that Moses told the people for a reason was to be in their mouths and in their hearts. It was to be in their mouths and in their hearts so that when the Lord Jesus appeared among them and spoke this way, or when his apostles in his name delivered this message, it wouldn't fall on deaf ears. They wouldn't just run around saying, uh, you're being sophistical, you're trying to persuade, you're trying to be an apologist. Uh, th they would actually grapple with this and say, yes, I am persuaded. This is the Jesus. This is the Lord who was promised to come and who had made himself known to us through the Old Testament. I also pointed out that Christ is called Lord in Colossians 3, 12 through 13, where he's identified as the one who forgives. There is no place in the Old Testament where it talks about the priest forgiving people. It's active here. It's talking about Christ as the one who forgives. There's only one Lord who forgives. Every Jew know this, knew this. In the Psalms, David says, you alone are the one I've sinned against. Daniel 9 says, to you belongs mercies and forgiveness. He is the only one who can forgive, and Paul says it's this Jesus. Jesus is the Lord who forgives. I also pointed out that in uh, Colossians 3, we're told to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Old Testament is replete with references to doing everything. It even itemizes these things. Paul just makes this general statement, whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Old Testament names all these things, swear by his name, bless in his name, walk in his name. Uh, and it says that God does all this too, saving, judging, guiding, everything in his name. We're to follow suit. So when it tells us that pagans are those who walk in the name of others, but the true people of God walk only in his name for his honor and glory, it's obvious then who Paul is telling you Jesus is. Zechariah 10 tells us that the eschaton will be marked by people walking in the strength of the Lord and in his name. That is not in the name of others, in his name alone. Paul says, in the name of Jesus. Again, Paul clearly calls Jesus Lord in this Old Testament sense. I also pointed out that Christ is to be the object of our faith, the one in whom we are to repose our entire confidence, something the Old Testament curses if it is not in the Lord alone. So Paul, again, identifies Jesus as the one Lord in whom we are to believe, and he leaves no question in our minds what he means by calling him Lord. He even says, 
that through faith in him, we are in power to serve him. He works mightily within us. What Lord can do this but the Lord of heaven and earth, the one Lord of Israel? Deuteronomy 6.4. I asked Andrew, I have no answer yet. If we were to ask a first century Jew or any Jew before and after who's religious, who claims to believe the Old Testament, who is the one Lord? in whom you're to put your faith, whom you're to fear, whom you're to serve with all your heart, in whose ways you're to walk, in whose uh, name you're to do everything, by whose power you do everything. What would he say? He would say, Yahweh alone. Yahweh is our Lord. Who would Paul say it is in Colossians? The Lord Jesus. And then I also pointed out that in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, Jesus is clearly identified as the creator of all things. This, the prepositions used there for Jesus are used for the Father in Acts 17, 28 and Romans eleven thirty six. 36. So that argument of Andrew's didn't fly. I pointed out that uh, it also says that Jesus is before all things. Now here, Andrew tried to say that it just means that he has preeminence. What he misses is the context is about Jesus being preeminent. He's called the, pr the firstborn, the one who's preeminent over everything. And verses 16 and 17 are given as the reasons for that. So when Andrew says he is before all things just means he's preeminent, it, he makes the whole passage circular. Jesus is preeminent because he's preeminent. That just doesn't work at all. No, this is being given as a supporting reason. The reason he is preeminent over everything is because he is before them. And moreover, it can't just mean preeminent here. It has to mean priority over temporal reality because this is leading up to the statement, in him all things hold together. Not simply the church, that's verses 18 and following, but all things that are created hold together in him. This is preceded by the statement, he is before all things. It gives force to it. So I don't think Andrew adequately dealt with Colossians 1, 15 through 20 in its presentation of Christ as the preeminent creator who is over all things and even exists before them. With respect to Colossians 2.9, I don't think Andrew is even really aware of and does or doesn't fully appreciate what Paul's whole point is here. Paul's whole point is that Christ is the all-sufficient deity. He's the one in whom all the fullness of deity dwells. And precisely for that reason, we don't have to look elsewhere. We don't have to look to other beings. We have all fullness in him. All the fullness of deity is in him, and therefore all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in him. All redemption is him. Reconciliation is in him. Everything is in him. The strength that you need, the forgiveness that you need, the peace that you need, all these things are in Jesus. And yes, Andrew, I am trying to persuade. Make no mistake about it. I am trying to persuade everyone who hears Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If you do not believe in him, you are not complete. If you're looking to anyone and anything else, or if you're looking to a Jesus who's less than this Jesus, who in whom is all the fullness, then you lack that fullness. You lack the redemption that is in him. You lack the reconciliation that is in him, the forgiveness that is in him, the wisdom and knowledge that is in him. All of it's found in him, and it's only found in him. You must turn to this Jesus. He is your only hope. And so, of course, I'm trying to persuade you. I am absolutely trying to persuade you. I believe in this Jesus with all my heart, as Deuteronomy 6 commands me. And I proclaim this Jesus with all my heart, as Scripture commands me, and as the apostles did, as the Jesus who has all authority in heaven and on earth commanded. The one who also said in the same chapter, by the way, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Andrew quotes the passage as though it's problematic for the deity of Christ, and yet he affirms it in the very last verse of the chapter. This is the Jesus that the apostles proclaim. This is the Christ I proclaim. This is the Christ you must believe in. Okay. This is not an idle matter. It's This isn't you know just a game or anything else. It is life and death. Colossians 3, 4 says, Christ is our life, talking about those who believe. If you don't believe in him, you lack life. You're still hostile and alienated in your mind, as Colossians 1 says. You need to be reconciled by the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be transferred out of the domain of darkness, Colossians 1, 14, into the kingdom of the Son the kingdom of him who made all things and redeemed, the one who died for sinners and rose again for their justification, the only one who could redeem us. He could redeem us precisely because of who he is, the fullness of deity. This was all foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Andrew, I'm curious to watch the video. He says he's got a video on his channel talking about the temple theme from uh, Genesis to Revelation. Well, how could he miss this astounding 
convergence of it all in Jesus. Jesus is what that was all pointing to. Jesus is the fullness of deity in the flesh. He's the fulfillment of that whole temple system. The whole thing was pointing to Jesus, to the fact that he would become flesh and dwell among us. John says it. Paul says it. They, they don't only say it in their own ways. They even say it in very similar ways. I pointed out how John says the word was with God and was God. The, the very grammar there means by nature. It's very similar to the Colossians 2.9 statement that in him dwells all the fullness of deity. Paul calls him deity. John calls him God. And then John says the word became flesh. Paul says the word, uh, the, the fullness of deity dwells bodily. John says uh, the fullness of grace and truth is in him. Paul says all the fullness is in him and from his fullness we have all received, John says. Great. Grace upon grace. Paul says in him, and because he's got all the fullness in him, we are made complete in him. We receive from him. Yes, 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 I want you to be persuaded of this. Yes, I'm insisting that you repent and turn to him. You owe him your repentance. You owe him your faith. You, you, have, you owe it to yourself. Why deny this Jesus? Why deny life? I don't even get it. To me, I, I, it, it boggles the mind whenever I see Unitarians spinning their wheels, trying to get out of this, trying to extricate themselves from these very clear passages. What's the gain here? You're robbing yourself. Colossians 2 says that you're defrauding yourself by doing this. 30 you're seconds. Robbing yourself. I'll conclude with that. Believe in Jesus and receive all the riches that he has. Okay, Anthony, thank you for that roughly 10-minute counter rebuttal. Andrew, you now have your 10-minute counter rebuttal as well. And so the floor is yours. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not too familiar with how this part of the debate is supposed to go. I did. I just got the format a few days ago, but uh, it's all good. I appreciate it. I like it. Uh, so I'm not sure I'll have quite as much to say. Um, but I, I guess I'll, I'll talk about why. I, I believe it's important to understand Colossians through the lens I've presented here and, and why I do what I do. And um, Anthony they believes that we're robbing ourselves. I, I'm pretty sure you ripped that out of context, but that's, uh, but that's, but that's okay. Um, but for me, I feel the exact same way about what he's doing and what the Trinitarians are doing. And I hope, Anthony does watch the video I presented about the temple from Genesis to Revelation and how that is such a big theme uh, of the Bible uh, and, and, and the, the part of the meta narrative of the Bible in which I, I chose to begin with. And, and in fact, I do understand the temple and I think he'll see that. And I, I would love his commentary and feedback about what he believes I'm missing about how Jesus uh, fulfills that. But when we talk about the temple, and this is important for Colossians because he, Jesus is being presented as the new temple, and, and, and even other in places in the New Testament. Um, uh, for instance, he talks about um, you see this temple, and, and you know, in three days, you know, it'll be destroyed, and I'll build this temple up, talking about his body, and he becomes this temple. Well, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the temple? What is the big deal about the temple? And the temple is that it housed the presence of God. When we talk about, when we see Adam in the garden temple of Genesis 1, he was in the presence of God and he lost that presence and that communion with God. And the whole Bible is about restoring that presence of God. And uh, I, I understand Jesus' part in that whole thing. I'm glad to discuss it. Um, but again, if God was pleased to dwell in the temple, because God's presence was in the temple, and so you have to understand this temple theme is that Adam was cast down from the mountain out of the presence of God. Eden was seen as a mountain, and Moses ascended back up a mountain to get back in the presence of God, to reestablish that presence. And when you see these temples, they're actually... Uh, microcosmic representations of, of of the cosmos, which is seen as a temple, but uh, the, the structure is still the same in that you have a holy of holies where you commune with God and the outer court where the priests are and uh, or the inner court where the priests are and the outer court where the, the non-priests are. And, and, and in the temple, you, you would have this presence of God 
in the Holy of Holies where the high priest would enter the presence of God. We see that Jesus entered into the true tabernacle, which is the cosmos. And the, heaven, the Holy of Holies is where God lives. And Jesus entered into God's presence uh, on our behalf as the high priest. And uh, but 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 the the temple was the place where God's presence was housed. But never would we say that the temple is God because God dwelt in the temple. So never should we say that Jesus is God because whatever God's fullness is, and we never really defined what it is, and that's because it's abstract. So it's not that it's completely unclear, but it's not so concrete that. You know, like the people like to use that as a proof text of deity, but never really define exactly what it is. They say, oh, what's that which makes God God? Well, that's question begging. What, what do you mean? What is it that makes God God? What are his characteristics? These things are found in Christ. The invisible God often refers to the comprehensibility of God and him being able to be understood. The God who can't be seen needs to be comprehended, and he, now he's comprehended because Jesus, as the, the logos, the reasoning of God, the image of God's reasoning, that which makes God known became flesh in him, and he began to express who God is, not who himself is. He said he's the Christ, he's, he's less than God, he's been sent by God to, expl to explain and express someone other than him, the invisible God. No one has ever seen the invisible God. The monogamous theos, the uniquely begotten God, you don't like it, that's not my problem, has made this invisible God known, the only true God known. He reveals the only true God. And so within Colossians, there's a lot of people that had their really strange ways in which they would pro. Uh, attempt to approach God and manipulate their fate and, and try to move things in the heavenly realm by doing all these aesthetic things and, and even speaking against the, the, the people who follow these, the Stoicaea, these elementary principles of the world, the movement of the heaven and the stars, like uh, the people who follow Torah observance. Torah observance and the Sabbath and these, and these things. So, is it, why would you want to go to this lesser revelation when every single thing that you need is found in Christ. Every single thing that you need to understand God is found in Christ, who is the king. And so when we go back again to this meta narrative, and the point of, of, of what Paul is saying in Colossians, he talks about wisdom, and this is really the crux of all conversations. If we establish that wisdom is not a person, the baby is put to bed. So Anthony and, and, and the Trinitarians, respectfully, they have to say that Christ is uh, with actually wisdom. Wisdom is actually a person. So that's the real crux of the debate, uh, or the overall arg arching, the overarching point of all of these debates that we're having. Is wisdom a person? Because what is wisdom? It's the truth, laws, and ideals through which God created for. These are immutable moral laws and ethical laws. And the root of all bad theology is saying that Jesus is God or he is wisdom because when wisdom becomes a person, actually wisdom disappears because it's nothing. And it just leaves us begging the question, well, what is wisdom? Okay, Christ is wisdom. Well, what does that mean? It's referring to a, a way that we must walk in our lives, the behavior by which man uh, must lead his life. And that's what Paul says, walk so that you can walk in him. You're not walking in an actual person. In is a dative of sphere, which speaks about th these things which are expressed and found in him. For Paul, all this wisdom of how we should behave is expressed and personalized in the person of Jesus. And I'll end there. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Let me stop the timer there. And move us into our closing statements. So it's been a comprehensive debate. I really like this format as it gives us more than enough time to interact with each other's points and engage the topic at hand. So Anthony, you now have 
five minutes for a closing statement. Go ahead. Floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Donnie, for moderating this debate and for doing so, so well as you normally do. And thank you also, Andrew, for engaging me in this debate. Again, I, I do, for as much as I disagree with Andrew and for as hopeless as I think his position is, I do like Andrew. Uh, I've had nothing but good times debating with him. Even when they are somewhat feisty, personally, I, I, I enjoy that. I, I think these things are important, and so there should be passion involved. So I, I do have a, a great deal of, of regard for Andrew as a person. As far as the position, though, of course, I, I disagree. And I think that the error here is momentous. It's, it's not a light or trivial matter. Andrew pointed out in his 10-minute rebuttal that the entire Bible is all about God restoring that presence that man lost in the garden, a presence man once enjoyed. But it's very interesting how the Bible talks about that presence. In Genesis 3, consequent upon man's sin, it says they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It's important to, play, to pay close attention to what it says there. It doesn't say they heard the Lord's steps, the sounds of his footsteps. It says they heard his voice walking. The subject doing the walking is known as the voice. The voice was walking. This is very similar to what it says in Genesis 15 when it says the word of the Lord appeared to Abraham. So here you have in Genesis 3 a voice walking, and in Genesis 15 the word appearing. This happens repeatedly throughout the Old Testament. This is where the Jews got the concept of referring to these divine theophanies as the memra or the logos, the word of God. This was a way of talking about God. God is referred to as the word, the kol Yahweh Elohim or the devar Yahweh or the logos in Greek. They also thought this was what was being referred to when the scriptures in Proverbs 8 and other places talked about divine wisdom. Andrew says the whole crux of this debate rests on this. I disagree with him. The whole crux of the debate doesn't rest on this. But I also disagree with him on how the Old Testament speaks of wisdom. Wisdom in Proverbs 8 is referred to as being begotten of God, born. Uh, it, it speaks of wisdom being God's master craftsman who is at his side during the work of creation. Wisdom is portrayed as a person there. And that's why the New Testament authors don't shrink back from calling Jesus the word and the wisdom of God and even the power of God. But the real crux of this debate is Paul referring to Jesus as Lord in that very clear Old Testament sense. And I've laid it out quite clearly, and I didn't hear anything even approaching a refutation of the several passages I pointed to where Jesus is called Lord in exactly the phraseology of the Old Testament. And so I conclude this debate simply quoting these texts in light of what we've read in Colossians. Hear, O Unitarians, Jesus is Lord. And you are to love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. His word is to be in your heart. This is what the Lord Jesus requires of you, to fear him as Lord, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord Jesus with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which he commanded for your good. Behold, to the Lord Jesus belongs the heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. For the Lord Jesus is the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. You shall fear the Lord Jesus, you shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name and do whatever you do in his name. He is to be your praise, for he has done great and awesome things. He made all things, he sustains all things, he accomplished redemption. Your only hope is to turn to him. If you believe in him, you will be saved. If you do not, you will not. And I conclude there. Thank you, Anthony, for that concluding statement. I do appreciate it. Andrew, we're now going to hand it over to you for your five-minute closing. Go ahead. Awesome. I do appreciate that. I appreciate the passion and the subject and the love for Jesus that we do share, even if it's not in the same way. Uh, I do want to say that he, he, we, the, the, the topic came up about persuading. I brought the topic about how Anthony is uh, sophistically tr uh, trying to persuade. My YouTube channel is literally called Unitarian Apologetics. Apologetics is an, a reasonable 
uh, articulation uh, of what somebody believes. Obviously, I wouldn't say that we should not try to persuade anybody of anything. What I'm trying to bring up here is the method by which we should persuade. I'll give you a perfect example because at the end there, Jesus, uh, Anthony talks about how Jesus is this awesome God, the Lord of Lords. He did not get that from the Bible. He's not quoting the Bible there. That's that's Anthony's version of the Bible, which doesn't exist in reality. Unitarian apologetics, we argue from the Bible and from sound hermeneutics. We're not trying to emotionally and sentimentally persuade you of something. We use sound hermeneutical methodology. I'm not saying that I'm the greatest at it or that I'm the elite hermeneut of the universe. I'm just demonstrating two different approaches to the Bible. The things that Anthony argues for, like most, if not all, Trinitarian apologists, of which I will say Anthony is the greatest of all of them, and that's why it's an honor to debate him. There's nobody else I would really want to debate. But nonetheless, the, the, the different approaches, the different approaches in trying to persuade people is what I'm talking about. A sophistic uh, method in trying to persuade somebody would be bringing up all of these points from all over the Bible, not proving them, and then lumping them together in, uh, uh, in, in order to persuade you of what he believes. But if you were to meticulously inspect these points, they could not handle the pressure of sound hermeneutics, and it causes them to say a lot of things that actual scholars would not say, nor would they agree with it. For instance, the idea that God never equals Trinity was brought forth by Trinitarian scholar Murray Harris. Andrew, never I think we lost focus on, on your camera. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe give it a wave. Yeah. Uh, Let's see my hand. There we go. Almost. I think it's coming back. Yeah, sorry about that. No worries. You're good. I wish it wasn't, but it is. There. Oh. I mean, should we just continue or? Yeah, no, no, no worries. I had you on yeah. pause, so feel free to continue. Exactly Sorry about that. That's okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Just the different approaches uh, to the Bible. You know, the, the, the title Yahweh, when we read Yahweh, it never means Trinity as if it's all three persons at one time. And we see this one figure. So we have to follow the storyline. And we and we and if it never if, if we accept this as true as Trinitarian scholar Murray Harris says in his book Jesus as God in the New Testament when he's called a handful of times this generic title God was it mean we'll see that by his wisdom Yahweh created the heavens and the earth it can't refer to the Trinity all at one time it's just one person who created through his wisdom and through his word one person was busy planning one person was busy foreordaining. And this one person is God, is the God of Jesus, it says in Colossians 1 3. Okay, and uh and, and so are we in the closing here? Are we in the closing? Are yes. we still in the, the yeah, dude, we're, we're in closing and you got about eh, for about 40 seconds left. All right, cool. So um so he talks about how Yah the, the title Lord means God, but then we read that it's the God of our Lord. And then so that would say that it's the God of Yahweh. That's nonsense. That's just not, that's apologetics, sophistic apologetics. And I understand that he's persuaded of that. And I don't think that he's doing it intentionally. But that's that's what's going on. It talks about 1 Timothy 16, 6, 16 being a reference to God. These are again not things that scholars say, and it's it's clearly a reference to the Father. And uh that's it. I thank you. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much for that concluding statement. And gentlemen, that concludes our 
20 minute openings, 15 minute rebuttals, 30 minute cross exam, 10 minute counter rebuttals, and five minute closing statements. Very comprehensive. You're both good sports. I like and appreciate the passion and how engaging the back and forth cross exam was. So, certainly a debate to remember on the deity of Christ. Very good and a very important topic. So, okay, let's dig into some of these questions. The audience has been very engaged in, in tonight's topic. And so it looks like we got a pretty solid mix of questions for the both of you as we've had a decent mix of views represented in tonight's live chat. So what we'll do in terms of format for the Q&A is whoever the question is for, we'll just make sure they get the last word. So say the questions for you, Andrew, obviously you get to respond. Anthony can rebut or uh, provide his thoughts. And then we throw it back to you for, for a quick final word. So, okay, with that, why don't we start? Oh, Anthony, it says you're on mute, but I think it's from your end. Oh, okay. Uh, I missed that part. What's the time limits on the first responder and then the other person? How about we go, if it works for you, gentlemen, how about we go two minutes each, but the final word only a minute? Oh, okay. Or, or we can go a minute each. I, I, I guess it depends on the question. Some might take a little longer to, to respond um, to than others. How about like there? the person who's originally asked gets two minutes, then the other person gets one minute, and then the other person, I mean, I don't know, something like that. Okay. Otherwise, okay, it'd be yeah. too long on one question. I don't know. I mean, it's up to Andrew, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. I think that's yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. So Andrew, say the questions for you. We'll go two minutes. Anthony will give you a minute to respond. And then I guess Andrew, you'd get the, the last minute. So okay. Let's start here near the beginning. This one's not necessarily specifying anybody, but we'll work through it and see who it's directed towards. Diego Colossians 1:15 says Christ is the image of God, but man was made in the image. Would that not show how Paul believes that the same one we were created in is the same we are saved by? I think it's directed at Andrew. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, thanks. I mean, the context is going to determine what's being said. Uh, Paul also says that man is the image of God. And so that doesn't that kind of falls flat. But but it's interesting what he says here because historically we'll see within ancient Judaism, uh, especially around the time of the New Testament, where the image is like for instance uh, for Philo, the image is the logos. And so man is made in this uh, this 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 the logos, which is the image of God. But the logos is not God. It's a reflection. It's this ideal version of what a man should be. Uh, and and so. I, I don't think that it's saying again that it's that it's this instrument like uh for instance uh it's not an instrument it doesn't say that he was made by the image of god it says that he was made in the image of god and the, the question is what is the image of god the image of god uh, refers to uh power and being a representative so no matter what if christ is the image of god it means he's a representation of that which uh, he is the image of okay thank you andrew Anthony, go ahead if you had uh, any thoughts. Yeah, so Andrew often says the, the context is going to determine something, but then he doesn't give us the context. The context in Colossians 1, when it refers to Christ as the image, then goes on to say, for in him all things were created, and also through him, and also for him, and he is before all things. So this clearly isn't saying that Jesus is a created image. It's speaking of him being greater than all things precisely as the image, and it explicates this by saying he made everything. And this points us back to, to Genesis 1, the creation account, where God said to someone, not to a mere idea, to someone, let us make man in our image. So there were other persons who shared this image who cooperated in the work of creating man. Who could that possibly be? It was God's word. Andrew brought up Philo. He did this before in another debate. I don't know that Andrew has even read Philo. I, Philo does not depersonalize the Logos. Philo thinks of the word as a person. I don't agree with everything Philo said, but he certainly didn't think that the Logos was just simply some impersonal ideal or abstraction. By the way, the word abstraction, again, does not mean unclear. It's simply contrasting things like love, truth, and beauty, and so forth from concrete physical things. So I don't think you know what that word means, but 
anyways, the, the Lord Jesus is the image, meaning the archetype, the one in whose image we were made. That's who he is, not something less than that. Thank you, Anthony. Andrew, feel free to have a quick final word since it was for you. Well, I did, may not have gone through the context here, but in my presentation, I absolutely gave the context, not just within the immediate context that Paul was calling Jesus the image of God as the king, as his beloved son, who has a kingdom. Throughout the whole Bible, we're saying that he's given a kingdom, uh, that he's given the throne of his uh, father, David. Uh, but the, but I did give the context as well as all throughout ancient history from thousands of years before Jesus came, past when Jesus came, the king was the image of the God that they represent. So you're going to say I didn't give context. I think that's just simply untrue. All right. Thank you, Andrew. And now we have one for Anthony. This one comes in from Ashley Myers. I appreciate the Question, and thanks for being a member for 19 months. So question for Anthony. Do you think Christ was in the Old Testament saints like he is in us? Old Testament saints didn't have the Holy Spirit unless for specific ministry, kings, priests, prophets. So did OT saints only have the Father in them? Go ahead. Yeah, so th this would really require a long time to talk about. I mean, it's not, I'm going to answer it, but it, it's not specifically relevant to the debate that we're having. I think Andrew would agree. But it's a, it's a big question, and there's a lot that goes into this. One thing to be said is that there's a clear redemptive historical difference between the Old and New Testament. Jesus in John 7 spoke about the Spirit being given, and, and John even says the Spirit had not yet been given. That's why Jesus is talking about this future occasion when this would happen. And it happens at Pentecost, and this is said to indicate or signal a tremendous redemptive historical change in history. This is something that was brought about because of Christ. At the same time, there's an issue here because a lot of things that the Old Testament believers did is stuff that the Bible says could only be done by virtue of the indwelling spirit. And so, for example, believing, uh, confessing the truth and these sorts of things throughout the New Testament, these are acts that are prompted by God, initiated by God, wrought by the spirit. For example, in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, nobody can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the spirit. And I, of course, think Jesus is the Lord of the Old Testament to bring this round to the debate. But, um, you know, the Old Testament believers certainly confessed the Lord. Jesus said that Abraham believed in him. He looked forward to his day. He saw it and was glad. And so uh, there's a sense in which we have to say that Old Testament believers did certainly have the ministry of the Spirit working within them. And yet we also have to say that there was a redemptive historical change and so what I've done, in effect, is sort of set up more of the problem than, than resolved it. But there is a way to, to iron this out a bit. Uh, but, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate it. Andrew, go ahead if you had any thoughts. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly what she means by Christ was in the Old Testament saints, because, again, we would be dealing with this this abstract concept of Christ being in people. And what do we mean by that? You could say that it's an actual ontological spiritual reality that's inside of yourself. But I see it more when Paul's talking about walking in Christ and being built up in Christ and being clothed with Christ, that these are specific behaviors uh, by which man, uh, for instance, uh, you, you know, models of behavior by which man should live. And in the Old Testament, uh, they thought that, uh, it is it is kind of hard to, to get into all this, but in the Old Testament, the, the, the Jews thought that wisdom was centrally located in the Torah and the law of Moses. But in the New Testament, we read that the, the law of Moses, if it, it was able to produce these things, Christ died for nothing. So what do you have Christ for? So in some sense, it, it, you know, Christ, they, they, they in some sense, they walked like Christ according to these moral, uh, you know, these moral concepts and, and moral laws and realities. Uh, but it would kind of depend on what you mean uh, by Christ being in the Old Testament, uh, uh, Old Testament saints. But yes, it is the Father and it is His Spirit. We read all throughout the uh, New Testament. It's the Father and it is His Spirit. It belongs to Him. And it is an emanation from Him. It is His Spirit. And it only is His Spirit was working in people, not Christ, because Christ didn't exist in the Old Testament. He came into existence in the womb of His mother. 
Anthony, go ahead. You can have the last word. Question was for you. Yeah, I thank you, Andrew, for walking right into that. You just heard Andrew say it was the Father Spirit, not Christ Spirit. Christ wasn't there in the Old Testament. It wasn't his spirit working in them and so forth. What does Peter explicitly say in 1 Peter 1? He says that the Old Testament prophets were searching to know what was being indicated through them by the Spirit. It says, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ. So 1 Peter tells us the Spirit of Christ was working within them and directing them toward this uh, future coming reality. Uh yeah, so I just go back, though, to the point uh, about there being a redemptive historical change, but there still has to be some allowance for the Spirit to work within people in order for them to have done certain things like believe and obey. And this, How can any fallen sinner believe and obey without the Spirit's grace? This is very clear in the New Testament. And uh, but by, by the way, I'll just say one thing real quickly. I heard Andrew say that uh, according to the Old Testament Jews, wisdom was in the Torah. No, according to rabbinic Judaism, according to ancient Jews, with the wisdom of God is a person. It's the word of God, the Logos, the Debar, the Kol Yahweh Elohim. <clears throat> Thank you, Anthony, for that final word. Now we got one for you, Andrew. And this comes in from a Christian $5 Super Chat. I do appreciate the support for tonight's debate. Andrew, since God is in heaven... And Jesus has all authority in heaven. Does that mean that God is under Jesus's authority? No, and it's as I brought up in 1 Corinthians 15. It explains this dynamic just in case anybody, I think Paul was just jumping the gun and just in case anybody ever got a funny idea like that. Uh, he says, then the end will come when he hands the kingdom to God the Father, for he must reign until all enemies are put under his feet. For God has put everything under, the, uh, everything under his feet. And it says explicitly, now when it says that everything has been put under him, this clearly does not include the one who put everything under him. So this is talking about the created realm of which Satan is the God of this created realm. He's the, he's the, he's the God. He's in charge of this created realm. And the idea is that Jesus has overcome death and has been given the power to defeat Satan. And then when all things have been given to Christ and he has overcome all things through the power of the God who resurrected him from the dead, when he would add, when all the things have been put under him, he will then give that created realm of dominion, the, the created dominion of, the dominion in the created realm back to God. This is speaking about all the authority and power that's in the created realm. Paul says it's explicitly in first Corinthians 15. Of course, this does not include the God who put all things under. Thank you, Andrew. Anthony, the floor is yours. Yeah. So we weren't debating first Corinthians 15 or first Corinthians. I did say I'd be happy to come back and do a debate. I think that whole chapter is worth debating vis-a-vis -vis what it says about Christ. But part of the problem here with Andrew and other Unitarians, he constantly talks about context and the context of the whole Bible and so forth, but this just shows complete disregard for the context of the whole Bible. I pointed out that according to Scripture, God reigns over all things simply by virtue of being the creator of everything. But there's also a sense in which things are not under him. They're in rebellion against him and so need to be subdued. And so Scripture speaks not only of God's providential kingdom, but of his redemptive kingdom. This is something that God realizes by means of his activity. He did it in the Old Testament, starting with Israel. He subdued them to himself. They became his kingdom, a kingdom of priests and so forth. And he's done it ultimately in a more radical way through the Lord Jesus Christ. When it talks about the kingdom being given to the Father or back to the Father and so forth, it's talking about Christ completing this redemptive historical kingdom. It's not talking about Christ ceasing to have that universal sovereign dominion that belongs to him as God. Otherwise, what do you do with texts that talk about Christ's dominion being eternal and unending and so on and so forth? Isaiah 9, for example, says of the increase in peace of his government, there will be no end. Luke echoes that. No, numerous passages talk about his eternal dominion. Does Andrew seriously think that Christ is some time in the future going to be something less than sovereign and so forth? According to him, 1 Corinthians 15 says it all. I say it only refers to the redemptive kingdom, not to the kingdom in the providential sense. Thank you, Anthony. Andrew, it was for you, so feel free to have a quick final word if you'd like it. Yeah, it's so the thing is we have to follow the whole the whole timeline of, of, of power God create God is is supremely powerful. This is a quality that he must if any being is to be called properly God, 
they have to have supreme power. They have to be the almighty. Uh, and, and never is Jesus called the almighty. Never is he portrayed as the almighty. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 15 is important because it, it, it presents the timeline of power. And it says that after all things have been subdued, he gives the kingdom back to God. He himself is made subordinate to God. He himself is made subordinate to God so that God, who is one person, may be all in all. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, now we got one for you, Anthony. Justin White, $10 super chat. I do appreciate the support. And so the question is this. John 1.1 1, 1 speaks of the word being God and becoming flesh and revelation. 19.12 says bearing the name, which is the word. Anthony, could you explain how these two verses match up? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's very simple, and maybe that's why the person is asking it, intending it as a softball question. But John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. So the Greek grammar there, it uses the imperfect form of the verb to be, meaning he always was. He's already existing when everything comes into being. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, proston theon. It's a way of speaking about two persons being with one another, so it's not just an abstraction. And then it says the word was God. So three times in that one verse, it talks about a subject called the word who is eternal, who is with the Father, and who is deity by nature. Then in verse 14, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So now we know who this is. It's the one who walked among us and was known as Jesus of Nazareth. In Revelation 19, it talks about the Lord Jesus coming from heaven on a white horse. He's called faithful and true, which is interesting, by the way, because there were alternate translations in Proverbs 8 about the wisdom of God. In verse uh, Later in the chapter, in verse 30, it, there's a word there which can mean master craftsman, but it can also mean faithful or true. And so in the book of Revelation, you actually have all the different ways you could translate that being used for Jesus. But there it says he's the word of God, who's faithful and true, he's coming down. So these match up quite nicely. By the way, Revelation 1.8 says the very thing that Andrew says is never said of Jesus. It calls him the Almighty. He's the one who's coming according to verse 7. The Almighty is the one who's coming according to verse 8. Verse 8 also calls him the beginning and the end. The same thing said of Jesus in 1.18 and also in Revelation 22.13. So Andrew's wrong. Thank you, Anthony. Andrew, floor is yours if you had anything you'd like to add. Yeah, first of all, Revelation 1-8 is clearly about the Father. He who was and is and is to come. You can scroll up a few verses back and you'll see that clearly somebody other than Jesus. Uh, but uh, to the question, it, it, I'll try to explain the dynamic here. But number one, they're different books. But John speaks about in the beginning was the Logos, uh, which is synonymous with wisdom. And it became flesh and dwelt among us just as wisdom was said to dwell among uh, the Israelites already in wisdom literature. Uh, also uh, worth noting in Revelation uh, 19, 12, we have in the wisdom literature, wisdom 18, uh, 15 through 17, it says that thy almighty word leapt from heaven from the royal throne as a fierce conqueror in the midst of the land of destruction. Sounds like With a it, person. Uh, well, it's not. It, 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 <laughs> well, 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 it is a person who's called the word, but let me finish. Amen. It, it, talk, it talks about with a sharp sword carrying the unfeigned commandment. Of okay, God's so this is exactly decree. what this is. This is exactly what we read about Jesus. But who is this person who leapt off the royal throne? The it word. is the, the, the destroying angel and, and the Passover event. It is the destroying angel, the Passover event. So what you're saying is that Jesus is the almighty word, and it's the same word that's here. You're saying Jesus is the destroying angel of the Passover event. The idea is just a word, a commandment, a revelation, which is going out. This is biblical metaphoric imagery. Okay. Anthony, you get the last word since it was for you, if you'd like it. I think yeah, you got it the says, last word. So the verse says, I know this by memory, when the night of Passover was half spent, God's almighty word, notice his almighty word, the very thing Andrew says is a term not used for Jesus, is here used for the Logos. His almighty word leapt from heaven's royal throne and bounded as a, first, as a fierce warrior into the doomed land and bore the inexorable, uh, or the sword of his inexorable decree. And then it says, his 
feet were standing upon the earth and his head was still reaching to the heavens. Does it not say that, Andrew? This is clearly talking about a person who's called the word, even his almighty word. So (laughs) amen a thousand times over. Andrew wants to correlate this with the destroying angel in the book of Exodus. I'm happy to go there with you. The word angel simply means messenger. Repeatedly, the messenger in the book of Exodus Mm. is simply called the Lord. The Lord is the Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. Exodus 3, 2, it was the angel that appeared to Moses. Exodus 23, he's the one who led them out of Egypt. Judges 2, 1, he's the one who appeared to the patriarchs. Jacob blessed his children in his name, Genesis 48. He's called God Almighty in Genesis 31, 13. Over and over again, that figure is identified as God. You admit that in wisdom literature, he's called the Word, even the Almighty Word. That's a person. That's a person. I agree. You're saying you're because you're putting words in my mouth. I just want to clarify. You're saying that I agree that who's called a word. You would, the, the passage says that this is about his almighty word. Doesn't it it's say about, that? It's about an angel, the destroying wait, angel. Wait, wait, wait. Passover. What does the passage say? But who's who is on the refer- throne? But who is it referring to? In the passage, it says the his destroying almighty angel. word. Is and his the destroying word. angel appears in the New Testament, and it's somebody other than Jesus. Uh, wait, 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 wait. You're saying that the, the angel who destroyed the firstborn of the Egyptians at the Passover is mentioned in the New Testament as someone the other dis- than Jesus? The, dis- the destroying angel is Where mentioned say anything in the about- New Testament. I, I mean, I could find it for you. I wasn't prepared. I, I don't have the whole Bible memorized like you do, but uh, it's not there. The, the destroying angel is mentioned in the New Testament. No, it it is. Let me, well, let me find if, it if you're for thinking you. of Acts chapter 7. It's talking about that being the same one who appeared to Moses in the wilderness in Exodus 3. So it simply affirms my point. The one who appeared to Moses is identified as God. You assume that Jesus is the angel of the Lord. You assume that, but you can't prove it. And you won't prove it. I've proved it. No matter what you say, the angel is somebody distinct from God who carries a message from God, not from himself. And who's called God. servants of God. What Jesus, does but, he you, say, but you what spent he, your whole time talking about how Jesus is greater than the angels, but then you're saying he is no, an angel. No, because I don't equivocate okay. like you on the meaning of the word angel. Okay. The word angel okay. in Hebrew, malach, and angelos okay. in Greek do not mean a created heavenly uh, number being. Number one, there's, there's, the more than, there's, more than, there's more than the one angel messenger. of the Lord. No, there there's isn't. Than, the word is it. always definite, and it never is used in the plural. It is not angel referring means to many. Messenger. Angel means the, messenger. The so angel where did the message Where did the message come from? Where did the message come from? One person. Thank you. The Anthony, message did not originate with the angel. He's a okay, messenger, the servant. Hey, let's do this, guys. I appreciate the banter, the back and forth. Very good. Uh, this one was for you, Anthony. So if you'd like, have a real, session. Yeah. <laughs> round two within round one. So, okay. Um, let's move along then. That's good. So now we got one for you, Andrew. Another one from a Christian looks like five dollars super chat. Appreciate it. Why does Jesus share these titles with God, Creator, Savior, Redeemer, Judge, the first and the last? I'll find it for you. Uh, so, so the idea is that um, that no one can be called Savior. Of you know, again, there's is doing the same thing that Anthony just talked about. He's saying, well, it depends on what we mean by angel, depending on the context. Is what he's saying. But but Yahweh says in Isaiah 43, 11, I am Yahweh and there's no savior but me. Right? Judges 3, 15, and again they cried out to Yahweh and he raised up Ehud, the son of Gera, a left-handed Benjamite, as their savior. 2 Kings 13, 5, so the Lord gave Israel a savior and they escaped the power of the Arameans. Isaiah 19, 20, when they cried out to Yahweh, who's one person because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender to rescue them. Acts 13, 23, from the descendants of this man, God has brought to Israel the savior, Jesus, as he promised. We see the Messiah in Psalm 45 referred to as God. Satan is called God, the God of this world. And so you share it as, as uh, you know, it said, Shared titles do not equal shared identity. All these titles can be given to certain people. Human beings can be called gods, according to Jesus Christ himself. Uh, So shared titles don't equal shared identity. Thank you, Andrew. Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, number one, I would agree that with some qualifications, shared titles don't mean shared identity. Part of the problem here is, though, while some terms can be used in an absolute way for God and then in a relative way for others, like terms like Savior, 
there are other terms that are exclusive to God, and the scriptures make this clear. For example, the covenant name of God. When Moses said to God, to the angel of the Lord in Exodus 3, what is your name that I may say to the children of Israel who it is that sent me to them? God says, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And then he goes on to give it a noun form, which is the word Yehovah, which translated as Lord in the Septuagint. That name is referred to as God's memorial name, meaning it's distinctive to him. That's what it says in Exodus 3.14. It's repeated in Hosea chapter 12. Elsewhere, God refers to his name as his glory and says he won't give his glory to another. That's why you might find false gods being referred to as God sometimes in Scripture, but they're never referred to as Jehovah. They're never referred to as the Lord in that sense. Moreover, there are characteristics that go along with this that when coupled together, exclude others. So for example, it's one thing to say somebody's called a savior. It's another thing to call them the Lord, our savior. Only Yahweh speaks that way. Look at Isaiah 43, the passage Andrew talked about. It's the Lord who says he's the only savior. Jesus is called Lord and savior in the New Testament. That's not said of the judges of Israel or anybody else. It's said exclusively of Jesus. And by the way, the question wasn't just about the term savior, but words like God, creator, first and last, and yes, Jesus absolutely is called the Almighty, the beginning and the end in Revelation 1.8. The same terms are used in 1.18 and in 22.13, uh, and they're used for And Anthony, Jesus. just to be clear, are, I'm, I, are, you from, are you aware of any time where Jesus has given the title creator? Yeah, so I would say Ecclesiastes 12 is a reference to the person of the Trinity because it uses the term booreka, which is plural. It I'm says, saying Jesus... Yeah, Jesus yeah, but, Christ in the, in the New Testament. Given, never... given my overall understanding of Scripture. So in, in Ecclesiastes 12, 1, it says, remember now your creators. It uses the plural. Yeah. So, yes, it does. It absolutely I know it does, does. but that's just that's there you go. apologetic yeah. hermeneutics. No, no, that, that's, that's, that's no, biblical that's hermeneutics. No, biblical hermeneutics. Pay, no, no oh, actual. You, you actual can, you can huff and puff, but the, the word is plural in Hebrew. And it's clear in Scripture there is more than one person who is creating. Genesis one twenty six. Let us make man in our image. Yeah. These Isaiah, are not things that actual Psalm, scholars say. Oh, okay. It's the Bible, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gentlemen, very good. Keeping things fun, engaging, and memorable. So, okay, let's move on to question for Anthony. Now, one of your biggest fans in the chat. We've had a good mix of. Uh, people and viewpoints tonight. Stacy Turbville, ten dollars super chat. Appreciate it for Anthony. He's coming at you. So his question is this: <clears throat> How is Jesus God when the Father has to fill him with the Spirit, who Jesus has confirmed was the Father in John fourteen ten and Paul here in Colossians one nineteen? Even in heaven, he still has a God. What are your thoughts, Anthony? Okay, so there's a loaded question here. He's actually asked several. Hopefully I have time to respond to all the problems involved in this now. But I do want to say as I go into this, Stacy's the guy that I knocked into a whole different error, right? So when I first debated Stacy, he was a modalist. After I debated him, he was a full-blown Unitarian. Now he wants to debate again. I told him, hey, wait a year or two before uh, debating again because I'd like to wait for your next position to come along before we debate. Uh but anyways, uh, so uh, Stacy asks, uh, you know, he says the spirit is the father, as Jesus says in John 14, 10. John 14, 10 doesn't say that. Stacy just makes these things up. I, I don't know if he dreams them, if he if they're the first thought when he gets up in the morning. There just, just doesn't say that. John 14, 10 does not say that at all. It doesn't even come within a million miles of it. And I think even Andrew might agree with me. I don't know. Maybe not. But uh he says, even in heaven, Jesus still has a God. What he's assuming, remember, Stacy Tuville, I call him Tuville because, well, that's another story. But uh, Stacy thinks he's a hyper preterist. So he thinks that everything's been fulfilled. And so he reinterprets the, the return of Christ. It's not a physical, visible, bodily event. He doesn't think Jesus still has a body. When, when I said earlier that Jesus can refer to the Father as his God, it's because the Word became flesh, and the God is the God of all flesh. He humbled himself. So Jesus can speak of the Father as God by virtue of that self-humbling. Jesus didn't cease having a body, cease having a human nature in heaven. He permanently dwells in bodily form. And so he can still speak that way even in heaven. So, And I think I even pointed that out to Stacy. so I don't know why he's still asking it. Maybe it's just a further proof of incorrigibility. I don't know. Thank you, Anthony. Andrew, floor is yours. Go ahead. 
Yeah, so first of all, the Father is not the Spirit. That much it, it, it is clear from the language of the Bible. The Spirit is something that is distinct from God. I would say that it's an emanation from God, uh, but it's not the Father. And and, 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 and the Unitarians have to stop saying things like this um, because uh, it, it's, just, it's, just, it's just bad theology. The Spirit is something that's put on people. It's something that's sent by God. It's something that God anoints people with, empowers them with uh, qualities they would not other, otherwise possess. Um, but, but you know, the thing about it, uh, you, you can't ask Trinitarians questions like this, and I'll tell you why, because they presuppose the an incarnation in a dual nature. It doesn't matter if Jesus has a God, because they presuppose the incarnation, uh, even though rule number one of what not to do when approaching the Bible hermeneutically is to bring presuppositions to the text. So, so really the debate is whether or not is the incarnation biblical that's the crux of the matter and it's not it's something they assume and something that they push across like anthony said in his debate well the christian view is this and and so he presupposes it and so it doesn't matter if jesus has a god to the trinitarians because dual nature he there's this some extra biblical rule where jesus is allowed to say all these things because he somehow humbled himself and did all these crazy things the bible doesn't talk about Thank you, Andrew. Anthony, would you like a quick final word since it was for you? Yeah, Andrew said the first rule of interpretation is not to presuppose anything. Absolutely false. It's to presuppose the truth of all of Scripture. We interpret Scripture with Scripture, in light of Scripture, the analogy of faith. I have no problem interpreting text of Scripture in light of other texts of Scripture because I think they all proceed from the one God, the, the divine mind, and God can't contradict himself. So everything has to cohere. John 1.14 says the word became flesh. That's not Anthony making things up, smuggling it into the Bible. Philippians 2 says that Jesus existed in the form of God and uh, took on the appearance of a man. That's not Anthony smuggling something into the Bible. That's right there. 2 Corinthians 8 says, he who is rich for our sakes became poor. I didn't smuggle that into the Bible. Paul wrote it in Corinthians. I also didn't smuggle into the Bible Colossians 2.9, a text that is directly part of our debate. In Christ dwells the fullness of the deity in bodily form. It clearly mentions him as deity. It clearly mentions bodily form. That is what we mean by two natures, whether Andrew and Unitarians like it or not. Nothing about an incarnation, though, right? Uh, <laughs> except for all those verses I just quoted. That you assume and you're not proven. So how about we, we had debate a debate on John 1. People can go back and watch, it's watch the that debate incarnation. And, see, and see how Andrew fared. Yeah. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Now we got, well, it's another one for you, Anthony. We got to make sure we get through these super chats. And so this comes in from pseudo Nim, $10 super chat. Appreciate it. Question for Anthony. You claimed Jews and every time Lord or Curios is used refers to Christ. What about first Peter three, six, Sarah called Abraham Lord. Second Corinthians four four Satan is Lord slash God. Will you retract your precept vaguely? What are your, what are your thoughts, Anthony? Yeah, it breaks my heart to see people speak this way. I mean, it just shows that there's been very little, I, I don't know, either effort or ability exercised here to understand what I said. First of all, I wasn't talking about Peter or anybody else. I'm talking about Paul. The, the New Testament writers, though, all writing under the special providential superintendence of the Spirit, had their own distinctive styles and personalities and vocabularies and so forth. Paul characteristically referred to Jesus as Lord outside of Old Testament quotations. This is just well known among scholars. I'm not making a controversial claim here. Somebody that Andrew respects, James Dunn, makes this point himself. He doesn't take things the way I do. I'm just saying he, he acknowledges this. This is Paul's style. And even in Old Testament quotations, it's almost always Jesus, according to Paul. So I don't deny that the other apostles use the term more liberally to also refer to the Father. And I don't even think Paul would disagree with somebody who said that the Father is Lord. I'm just saying, in terms of his literary style, he doesn't talk that way. He's always talking about Jesus when he says Lord. Moreover, I even referred to Abraham calling Sarah, or Sarah calling Abraham Lord in my opening statement. I don't know how that was missed. My point is that there's a sense in which people on earth can be called lords, and there's an exclusive sense in which this term is used for the Lord in heaven. There's only one of those up there. Anybody who calls anyone Lord in a religious sense 
is ipso facto a heretic and a blasphemer according to the Old Testament. So that's the point that I'm making, that Jesus is identified as that Lord, not simply an earthly master. He's the Lord in heaven, the one that you must give all your obedience to, the one you must walk in his name and fear him and serve him and, and so forth. So, so that was the point that I was making. And, and by the way, I don't even agree that 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is referring to Satan. I know that's a popular interpretation. Simply read the literature. This isn't even agreed upon by all scholars. There's good evidence against it. It doesn't even mention Satan there, by the way. Appreciate it, Anthony. Andrew, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, um, it, it is true. I mean, it's it's undeniable that Paul, um, in his rhetoric, uses these uh, these verses about Yahweh and, and refers to Jesus in a Lord uh, that for him is uh, in, in almost in some other way. I say almost, almost as if he's somehow God in the flesh, as if it's referring to Yahweh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, a clear reference to Yahweh. I acknowledge that. You have to acknowledge that. Uh, but concerning your point, you make a good one, because if every, first of all, every time, I, if Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 6, the Father is called the Lord of Lords. The idea that that refers to Jesus is, is nonsense. You are uh, but re Respectfully, respectfully, uh, you attempted to in the short amount of time we have for the debate. It was pretty. But, but let's let's assume that let's assume that every time Jesus is called Lord, it means Yahweh. We talk about in in first in Colossians one three, the God of our Lord. If you say that's like saying the God of Yahweh, incarnate. So that's exactly what's. Thank you for leading me to my next point. That's <laughs> the I'm only a, nice way guy. that I appreciate it. Uh, the only way they get around this as Anthony just demonstrated, is by presupposing John the doctrine of dual nature, which they haven't proven. He didn't argue for it. He assumes it. He says this is a Christian worldview. Doesn't prove it from Colossians. Doesn't prove it from anywhere. These are this. I'm, I'm telling you the difference between apologetics and hermeneutics, the, the sophistic apologetics, to where he assumes all these things and just throws them on the text versus hermeneutically demonstrating them. Thank you, Andrew. Anthony, you can have a final word. Yeah, instead of calling it sophistic, you should call it sophisticated because your approach to the Bible is entirely <laughs> simplistic and naive. The Bible is a unified whole. It's given by one God. If I assume the truth of what John says in John 1, 14, or what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, or what Paul says in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, uh, when I'm looking at the rest of the Bible, I'm not doing something illicit there. I'm doing something classically Christian. We've been doing this for 2,000 years, and we're hoping and praying that Unitarians will catch up with the program. Okay, There's one God. He speaks with one voice in Scripture, not a forked tongue. He's not Satan. He speaks one unified message, and so we can presuppose its consistency. Saying I'm reading these things into the Bible, what do you think 114 means? The Word became flesh. Okay, there, there Clearly, there's a Word, and he became flesh. There's something true about the word antecedent to his becoming flesh. And if there's something true of him antecedent to that and he becomes flesh, there's two things. There's two things that need to be taken into account there. What the word is antecedent to the incarnation and what he is now as a result of the incarnation. And I have no problem demonstrating this is incarnation. I did it in our debate. And it's really pretty obvious, according to these texts, that there's no sophistication, you know, uh, nothing nefarious going on when I point out that uh, Colossians 2.9 says in Christ dwells all the fullness of deity. I mean, it's just it's, it's easy. I don't think it's that hard. I think you're spinning wheels, your wheels and working hard not to get it. But you don't have to. You can lay down your arms and follow it. Let me ask you, worship him. let me ask you if we can go just a little bit off, because you, you talk about. This is important to why we even debate. We, we shouldn't. We're not, we're not debating in vain or for vanity, right? Because you say that you're hoping that Unitarians, such as myself, will come to understand what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. Why? What is the benefit of understanding what you're teaching? Life. What do you mean? That's you know that's vague. As in, as in <laughs> if you think that's vague in this context, I'm telling you, you need life. to believe in Him for eternal life. You are lost without yeah. Him, Andrew. So, you have so no saying, hope without him. That's not true. That, that's not true. Uh, it's absolutely true. He is the, the way, yeah. the truth, and the life. Unless okay, you so, come to so, him, you will be lost. Okay. So is that it? 
you're just saying that basically you're saying I should believe what you believe because without that, I will not have, I will not have life after death. Is that it? Is that it? What do you mean? Is that it? I, I, is that you, it? you think there needs to be a better reason to believe That's in Jesus? Something. Yes, I do. <laughs> That's the difference between our approaches. So I want you, you want me to believe Wait, it as you, all no, I'm telling you, the people in, in, in Trinitarianism, they only want you to believe Jesus God so that you can have eternal life. No, which no, is no. A, of course, of course, there's more to the gospel if that's what and, you're asking. And what is there? That's what I'm asking you. What yeah, is the th benefit this of, Lord, of accepting this your Lord became flesh for us men in yeah. our salvation, and he died on the cross to atone for sin, to endure the judgment, the penalty that was otherwise due to us. Mm -hmm. And he rose from the dead triumphantly, demonstrating that he paid the penalty for sin, mm -hmm. and he ascended okay. up into heaven and there represents his people and intercedes for them such that mm -hmm. they can confidently rest secured by believing in him that knowing that they have eternal life they've been forgiven by god they've been accepted as righteous in jesus this is so the gospel message paul says it's of first importance pretending it's not of first importance or that you can dispense with it i just don't get it it's so right it's, there in the bible so it's life after death and then that hope and that it's understanding life right that now hope. too you could have life okay. right now Meaning eternal what? Life. in what way in what way <laughs> do I, I mean, how does it benefit you and this all ties into the meta narrative of the Bible, and so we're just approaching. So, so you, life, you, life. If you're asking me to give a full or biblical explanation of what life is, I'd be happy to do that. How long do you want to sit around here? How long do you want to listen to this? So, Scripture speaks of life first of all as something that endures; it continues. That's why it's called eternal life. But it also refers to it as a quality, so that Jesus can say that eternal life consists in knowing you, the only true God. So it's it's not just uh, 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 an existence, but a quality of existence. And this life is ours through Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, you must come to me for life. But you're saying that life exists, but you're not saying what it is. You're not saying what it looks if like. If you didn't even hear what I just said, I, mean, I could go back over I that again, you. and I, I could say you. more. We, we can move but on. It really isn't that to... hard. It really isn't that hard. I think you know very clearly what I'm talking about. Without Christ, you lack communion with God, and you will perish forever. That's in Christ, you'll have... It's a biblical assertion. It's Anyone who doesn't nothing. believe in the Son, the wrath of God continues okay. to abide in him. John what is 3, the evidence? What is the well, objective evidence that somebody has communion with God? What does that look like, objectively? Well, Scripture says, if you believe, you have eternal life, and you will not what come that to What does that objectively look like? Okay, let's allow Anthony to answer like, them, then we'll move on. It looks like this, Andrew. I believe in the Son. I have life. If you want this life, come to the yeah. same Son. You believe in something. Congratulations. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. In Jesus. I've had a lot of fun tonight. It's been an excellent debate. Definitely worth a, a rewatch. Uh, I think we're down to the last one, maybe two super chats, and then we're going to wrap things up. Anthony, I know, I know you've got a, an after show. So the fun continues over on your channel. So Justin White, $10 super chat. I think this is a question for the both of you. Why don't we start with you, Anthony? And that way, Andrew, you can get a last word here as well, just to keep things as balanced as possible. So Justin says, hi, Anthony and Andrew, enjoying the chat. I agree. It's been a great chat tonight. Just clarity on Christ being God in flesh. Do you believe Christ was God in flesh before or after his resurrection? Yeah, so I would say that it's a false antithesis. Christ has always been God. God isn't something you become, not if we're using the word God in the absolute sense. Christ is called God not only after his resurrection, but before it. Thomas confessed Jesus as God in John 20, 28. When he said, my Lord and my God, which is an echo of the Psalms where Yahweh is called my Lord and my God. No Jew would call any man his Lord and God like pagans would in reference to, say, the emperor. A Andrew thinks this is the sort of thing that's going on here. Thomas, a Jew, is calling Jesus my Lord and my God after the resurrection. But the Apostle John refers to Jesus as God in eternity. In John 1, 1, he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. All things became through him and without him, nothing became that has become. Jesus echoes this same language when he says, before Abraham became, I am. Both of these passages in verb, uh, involve a contrast be between a, a verb for existing and a verb for becoming. Jesus, according to John 1, has always been, and everything else became through him. John 8, 58 says Jesus has always been, Abraham became. So he's always been God. He never became God. He did become flesh, and he's still flesh. So I would say he's God from beginning to end. 
Thank you, Anthony. Andrew, the floor is yours. Yeah, I appreciate the question. It's a great question. Um, the thing is, it's it's all about the dynamic. Uh, I'm 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 much more to closer. Like I'm I'm probably as close as you can get to being a oneness Pentecostal without collapsing identity. Um, and so, if we say that the logos is is God, well, it says the logos became flesh and dwelt among us. That would be in the flesh. And so now, in this resurrected state, Jesus is given this uh, authority and a power in order to act on behalf of God to reconcile all things back to His God. Um, so, I don't believe Jesus is literally God in the flesh, but in in some very real way. He is God. In some very real way, you could say that God was crucified um, because when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They crucified Jesus because of the words that he spoke and the truth that he represented, which his Father foreordained and, and, and empowered him with. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for both those responses. We got a uh, last second super chat here, and then we will call it. And so uh, Slam RN, thank you very much. $10 super chat. Really appreciate the support for tonight's epic debate, I'd say. This has been really great. So, okay, it's for you, Anthony. Can you explain how all three members of the Trinity raised Jesus from the dead? Yeah, so one, one thing, just to take a step back real quick, Scripture speaks of all three persons as the origin and source of all things, including life. And so Genesis 126, when it says, let us make man in our image, there's clear plurality there. There's a uh, cohortative in the Hebrew. These others are being addressed to join in this work. That's why you have passages that say our creators or Psalm 145, where God is referred to as our makers using the plural. Those makers are spelled out in scripture. Psalm 104, 30 says you send forth your spirit and they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Andrew quoted a passage earlier. I thought it was humorous because it's my view where it says that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made or, or God making all things through his wisdom. That's my view, right? But he depersonalizes the word and wisdom of God. Scripture doesn't. The word is a person. So the word and wisdom of God are those persons by whom he made all things. So they're the source of life. So we just shouldn't be surprised when we go to the New Testament, we see with respect to the resurrection of Jesus, that all three persons are involved in raising him physically from the dead. Nobody would doubt that the Father raised him. Galatians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, sent not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So God the Father raised him from the dead, according to Galatians 1, Romans 10, many other passages. But Jesus also raised himself from the dead. John 2, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews misunderstood him. They thought he was just talking, you know, in in. Uh, esoteric ways, uh, but Jesus is there actually identifying himself as the true temple, John says. Uh, he was referring to the temple of his body. So when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days, he's ascribing to himself the active agency of his own resurrection. Same thing can be seen in Romans 8, where it talks about the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, you know, if, if uh, he's in us, then he'll also give life to our mortal bodies. Peter speaks of uh, Jesus being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So numerous passages of Scripture ascribe the resurrection of Jesus to all three persons, not simply to the Father. Appreciate it, Anthony. Andrew, floor is yours. Well, I, I don't think that, I don't believe in a trinity. I, I, I do I do believe in, in somewhat of a trinity. I believe the Father is not the Logos, is not the Holy Spirit, but they're all three divine hypostases, which is controversial among Unitarians. But nonetheless, I don't think that all three, whatever they are, are, are involved in raising Jesus from the dead. Anthony says that, well, Jesus says, I'm going to raise myself. Well, well, then what is the Father doing? Or what, what is the Spirit doing? Well, if Jesus, was he not able to do it by himself? We said he did it himself. So is Jesus the father then? And so the dynamic is a great question because the dynamic is what has to be understood when over and over and over again throughout the New Testament, it says the father raised him from the dead and the spirit of him, which is the father's spirit is in you. And it leads to another question, which is important of why I debate and uh, it is, is why, why are we doing this? What, what is important that we understand is that 
is what it was it what is it that caused Jesus to be able to be resurrected from the dead and what is it that Jesus says will will well up in in humans to become a a, a, a well within us springing up to eternal life and that's the logos and living in accordance to the logos all right thank you Andrew and Anthony you can have the last word if you'd like it since the question was for you I don't know what that was I just heard. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just dismiss John 2 because you don't know how it can say the Father raised him and Jesus raised him, so one of those has got to go? That's just not how you do theology. John 2 says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. In John 10, Jesus says, I have the power to lay my life down, the power to take it up again. So Jesus clearly ascribed the resurrection to himself, and we can't jettison that because we don't know how to fit that into our theology. Well, you're left with our the burden, theology which, is based which, which, on the Bible, the whole Bible, not just you're, those verses. You're left, like. you're left with the burden of explaining the Father and the Spirit's role in that dynamic. It's what the question he's asking. So you're just saying Jesus said, did everything. Question, first of all, you the said Father the question he's the, asking, this is a lady. But secondly, where does it say right. what you just said? That's not what it says. It says, explain how all three members of the Trinity raised Jesus. And I just did. All three did. You, you explained one line, how one John person. 2, John 2 and Romans 8 and 2 Peter 3.18. Well, then what was the Father's role in the in the resurrection of Jesus? So, what was his role? So, what did so he do? You, think, you, you think if... It says Jesus raised himself, the Father raised him, the Spirit raised him. Then those aren't true unless I can give you further uh, explanation. I mean, I'm, I can. I'm just saying, is that really no, this, how you do the theology? Is asked, Until the, the you know there's is, a further question, you're not going to go this far? No, the question is, can, can you, you affirm, explain can the you dynamic? Can you that John 2 says Jesus would raise himself from the dead? Just say it. Just let I, everybody I see can. it. I can, but the question is about how all three members Wait, raised Jesus ra of the say Trinity. Say Jesus raised himself from the dead. I want you hear have it. the burden of explaining what the Father's say, role say is. Say Jesus raised himself from the dead. Say you can't explain the Father's role. I, we're not there yet. Say Jesus raised himself from the dead. Just do it. Come on. He did. Amen. But but it doesn't mean he was outside of himself and picked himself up. He just raised from the dead because God the Father raised uh, him from the dead. You, you're dismissing the Father's role. I didn't dismiss the you father's can, role. You can't explain it. <laughs> then, then explain to us the father's uh, okay, role. Okay, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Let's pretend for a moment I can't explain something, and therefore it's just not true. I don't. I mean, again, I don't get this. You can't I, explain it. I, just I can't, explain, can't explain. It. I can't explain why my feet are fastened to the earth. Okay, you Using can't explain gravity. It. Thank you. <laughs> you can't explain it. That's okay. All right. That's anyway, okay to admit. <laughs> There's yeah, at the least one sports. thing in the world you don't know, and I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> There's two right, things. Sometimes I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> hey, you guys are giving us one to remember, and and I want to thank you both for that. So, okay, here we go. I'm not sure who this one is for. Just talking about five dollars super chat. I do appreciate the support. And again, I really am thankful for how engaged our audience has been tonight. Lots of positive feedback. Some lively, passionate discussion as well, of course. Okay, so. Here's the question. Is Psalm 110 spoken by David in the perspective of God? And if so, is the grammar confirming Trinity with God slash Jesus as Yahweh? Okay, so I think, Andrew, it's more so directed at you. So go ahead. Oh yeah. Um no, it's it's not it's not confirming. I mean, this is debatable. I don't think we have enough time to go over all the aspects, but it uh it it doesn't it says the, the Lord said to my Lord, the, the grammar is is out of knee. I already know how Anthony's gonna respond to this because I've seen his debate with Carlos on this very thing. Poor Carlos. Um, but uh now the grammar does not uh confirm the Trinity, and and, and that's what's funny is the, the grammar doesn't the grammar is only of one step in the hermeneutical process, context determines what is meant. Uh, and, and it says, the Lord said to my Lord, how this is used in the New Testament is that simply that Jesus is superior to David. That's what he's saying. And he says, sit at my right hand. And, and people often argue, well, seated at my right hand means that he's subordinate to God. But then, of course, it says that Yahweh is at his right hand. And if you look in the Hebrew Chaldean lexicon, it just says that, being at someone's right hand means you're providing assistance. So there's a time where the, the the Messiah can provide assistance to God, and then there's times where God can provide assistance to the Messiah. 
Uh, but the grammar itself does not confirm the, the Trinity. Context would determine the Trinity. And the Trinity is, it, uh, as in a tripersonal God, does not exist in reality. Thank you. Anthony, floor is yours. All right. So, so I agree with Andrew as far as this. Uh, grammar is not the only thing. Context matters. Sometimes all the grammar can do is rule out certain things, but it leaves some options open. Sometimes it's very restricted. There's no other options other than to take it a certain way. Yeah, but but most of the time you have to combine other things, grammar, context, and even the canonical context of something. So I, I think, unlike many people, that the Psalms are not discrete. They're intended to be read together so that there are groups of Psalms and even books of Psalms. And, and so the, even the, there's a broader context. They're not just one-offs and standalone. But anyways, in, in Psalm 110, it says, Neum Yehovah. Adoni, Yahweh said to my Adoni, my Lord. Now, what Unitarians say here, what I think Andrew is limping towards, is this idea that he's called Adoni, not Yehovah. But the problem is the term Adon is used for God many times. The E at the end is simply the Hebrew Yod, which means my, it's the possessive. That doesn't change the fundamental meaning of the word, right? Because sometimes Unitarians say it's never used for for God, but Adon is, and the, the Yod prefix doesn't change the fundamental meaning of the word. But here's the interesting thing. Andrew said context, remember? In verse 5, it says, so in, in verse 1, it says, Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So who's at the right hand, according to verse 1? It's Adoni, David's Lord. In verse 5, it says, Adonai is at your right hand. So now the one who's at the right hand is called Adonai. That way of referring to the Lord is always a divine title. It never refers to a human being. And so the same one who's at the right hand is called La Adoni, my Lord, and he's also called Adonai. Moreover, what's very interesting is in the Hebrew text, the continental, well, I don't want to get into this, it's a bigger issue, but uh, you'll have to watch some of my videos to get into that. But the, contextually, this one is identified as Lord. It uses an exclusive divine title for him in verse 5. Thank you, Anthony. And Andrew, you can have a quick final word if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, so, so this, here's the, here's the argument. Okay. Is, is that, is that Ladoni is never referred in that specific, specific construct to refer to God. It's always used referring to human Lords. People will say like my Lord came and it's referring to a human Lord. Anthony is saying that Adon is used of God and he's correct. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, that the, from my understanding, my limited understanding that I'm limping towards, as Anthony says, uh, Ladoni, that specific uh, construction uh, I of like the when word. You me. I, I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, In agreement, that, I mean. In agreement. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Um, but that when it says Ladoni, that's. It's never used referring to Yahweh. It's always referred to human lords. That's just my understanding of it. So, All right, gentlemen. We've made our way to the end. That was a pretty awesome audience Q&A. We got uh, a couple surprise impromptu uh, debates and, and secondary cross-exam in there. So that's good. <laughs> Anthony, were you going to say something? No, I just oh. uh, I, I think it's great. Andrew was a good sport. Absolutely. This was an excellent debate. I've really enjoyed myself. I know the audience has as well. You gentlemen did not disappoint. And so what I'd like to do, though, is firstly, thank the both of you for, for the time that you've given to us for this very edifying debate. It's definitely one of those debates on the deity of Christ that people are going to want to watch several times in order to analyze and examine all, all the points that were made. And so, gentlemen, let's get some quick final words final thoughts, if we could. Andrew, why don't we start with you? Again, I appreciate you doing this. And final words? Oh, uh, yeah. No, I appreciate, uh, of course, Donnie for hosting this. Anthony, uh, a true master of his craft. It's, it's an honor to debate him as it was the first time. Um, I thought it was really good. Um, I, I hope we can debate on topics in the future if Anthony's willing. Um, but overall, I'm just very grateful. Uh, and, and I thought everything went really well. Absolutely. I agree. I think it was a, an excellent de debate and I'm glad the way things went. And so Andrew, thank you for those final words, final thoughts. 
Anthony, thank you again for doing this. I appreciate your time. Final words, final thoughts? Yeah, basically the same thing. I thank you both for this. Uh, you know, sometimes I get into these and I think right before it, I'm thinking, what am I doing? I, you know, because really, as much as people think of me as a debater, I don't actually relish this. <laughs> I'd rather be sitting here reading a book. <laughs> But I do love telling people about Jesus, and that's why I end up doing it anyway. You know, I, I could think of a hundred things to do. I could be out eating tacos or something, but uh, telling people about Jesus, I love that. And so it gets me to do things that I may not, in one sense, want to do, you know, sitting sitting around for hours arguing back and forth. Uh, so I thank Andrew for this. It was a great time, and I'm more than willing to do things in the future. So Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Definitely a fun time. I appreciate you guys doing this. And also thank you for obviously the work and, and time, energy and effort you both put into the prep for this debate. Again, the question, does Colossians teach the deity of Christ? And so, okay, I'm going to let our guests out for the night. Everybody uh, go check out Anthony Rogers after party for some more deity of, of, of Christ discussion. So Anthony, Andrew, thanks again, gentlemen. We'll talk later. Thanks. All right, guys, that is uh, another one in the book. So I really enjoyed that debate. I've been looking forward to uh, this one for a while. The uh, last debate that we had with Anthony and uh, Sean got a lot of great feedback. It's still accumulating uh, lots of views. I highly recommend people check that out. And this one did not disappoint as well. Anthony and Andrew, I believe, gave us a, a good solid debate and certainly a, a debate to remember on one of my favorite topics, the deity of Christ, a very important topic. And so real briefly, I will go over some announcements and reminders for everybody. We are, of course, having another week full of debates. Uh, last night, we had Will Kinney and Turretin fan the great Bible translation debate. That was a comprehensive one. I really enjoyed that one. Of course, tonight, Anthony and Andrew debate on the deity of Christ. Tomorrow, we've got another debate on the deity of Christ. Praise I am versus Sean Griffin. No relation, Sean Griffin and Andrew Griffin, from, from my understanding. So this one should be good. And then we're going to be mixing in some solid eschatology related debates for everybody. And so we're going to be here at the end of the week with professing preterist and pastor Anthony Aquino debating the question, is full preterism biblical? I'm looking forward to this one. I know these gentlemen have been doing a lot in terms of preparing for this. Next week, we've got the great full preterism debate. So another debate on full preterism, uh, the resurrection of the dead. Dr. Don Preston and uh, Chris Date. So they're going to be here on Standing for Truth next week. Lots of hype, lots of excitement for this one. Awesome loss and clips. I do appreciate that. Says great debate tonight. I agree. This one was very thorough, a lot of fun and exciting. That cross exam was very fast paced. It was engaging and I, I really enjoyed it. Not a boring moment at all tonight. And so, okay, next month, we've got quite a few for everybody on the topic of soteriology. So next month, we're going to be having the great James 2 debate, controversial passage, hotly debated uh, passage with a diversity of views on it. And so we're going to have Dr. Bob Wilkin, Sean Griffin engaging that topic. We're also going to be having Dr. Robertson Jenis here to debate Chris Morrison, the great salvation debate is justification by faith alone. And then we're going to have a showdown on once saved, always saved. All three of these are soteriology related. And so we're going to have AK Richardson and pastor Tommy McMurtry to engage this always fun topic. Lots of passion on this topic, that's for sure. So make sure to hit the notification bell on all three of those. We've also got a great uh, Protestant versus Catholics debate coming up next month as well. April 8th, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. The Immaculate Conception, Biblical and Ancient, question mark, Turretin fan and C.J. Cox debating William Elbrecht and Elijah Yassi. And I'm excited for that one. That one should be uh, another comprehensive debate. And this month, we've got uh, several 
open mic debate challenges to the evolutionary community. I'm exceptionally excited for this one. Paul Price, Ian Juby, well known in the world of Young Earth Creation. They've both done some fantastic uh, work on these creation versus evolution related topics. So they're going to be here to give a presentation on poly straight trees and how poly straight trees provide overwhelming, provide amazing evidence for a young earth and the Genesis flood. And so they're going to be here for not only a presentation, but also an open mic debate challenge. So all are welcome for impromptu discussion, debate, and Q and A. We've also got an open mic on the geologic column. This will be a two-in-one event, Doc and Dr. Dino. So there'll be a formal debate at first. And then we're going to open it up for an open mic for the second hour, which will still focus on, geo on the geologic column. And then at the two-hour mark, we will open it up for a general open mic on all things creation versus evolution. And so, okay, I think I'm going to wrap it up there, everybody. Again, another one in the books and another one in the Nature of God debate book. So if you enjoy this topic, this is one of your favorite topics uh, to listen to. You find them edifying, important. Please go into the uh, description box or the playlist section. You'll find a playlist titled Nature of God Debates hosted by Standing for Truth. And you will find all sorts of awesome debates on the deity of Christ, the Trinity, and nature of God related debates, uh, hours and hours worth of content to, to keep you busy. And so, all right, I appreciate uh, the time that the debaters have given to us for tonight's important debate and also for everybody uh, joining tonight. I really appreciate the, uh, the super chats the support. You guys are the life and blood of this ministry. Your gifts are exactly why we're able to put out full-time content, continuous content day after day, and put on so many important debates. And this is the best way to get out of our theological echo chambers, our scientific-based echo chambers, get us into the debate octagon or the debate dojo to discuss these issues in a sophisticated and professional manner. Truth Defenders, my brother says, see you kids at Anthony Rogers after party. And so we've had a, a comprehensive debate tonight and the fun continues over on Anthony Rogers channel. So please go check that out. Should be starting soon. If not already has started pseudonym appreciate the last minute two dollar super chat this was wholesome brothers and sisters thanks donnie i appreciate it that's what i'm here for i'm just here to serve and i'm just here to provide the community and every other community for that matter with the uh the, the best possible debates out there to to edify and to leave no stone unturned on all these different topics. So if you like debates on all sorts of topics, whether it's soteriology, the nature of God, eschatology, creation versus evolution, all things science and ancestry, do make sure to hit that subscribe button and share this content around with your friends, your family, share it around on Facebook and all of your other social media platforms in order to uh, spread the message, get people interested in these discussions and in these these exchanges because the truth is important and critical thinking is also very important. And so, okay, everybody, thanks again for tuning in. This has been an excellent show. This debate certainly did not disappoint. And so thanks again to Andrew and Anthony. All right, guys, God bless. Thanks again for tuning in. Standing for Truth is out.